when I did the bike ride. So we went through Nevada. Arizona was an amazing, that was our next from uh, Nevada. We did 120 miles in 120 degree weather. Oh, that was pretty much the hardest day at that point. Kirkwood Mountain, 14,000 feet in elevation in one day. But, yeah, I actually set the record the second time for the extended route to complete the, it was downhill at the end. It was fast as fuck. I went like 82 miles per hour. No on, way on a bike? On something the width of a dime. Holy shit, bro. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to 118 of the Andrew Deitch Podcast. If you're new to my show, thanks for checking it out. Um, if you are new here, um, my show is all about having amazing conversations with some of the most fascinating people that I know. And before I jump into the show today, I just wanted to mention that this episode is brought to you by Eyes Ahead Media. Eyes Ahead Media is a digital content creation agency that focuses on creating video content for businesses and brands. So if you're looking for a long-term video strategy, um, definitely go check them out, eyesaheadmedia.com. They actually produce this podcast. So shout out to the Eyes Ahead Media team who's editing this podcast right now. As I mentioned before on this podcast, video is one of the most powerful ways to get your message across. So if your business is um, looking for video content, then definitely hit them up. My guest today is David Orlin Brown, AKA Mr. Atlanta. He is the founder and CEO of Stay ATL. He was also a former Atlanta City Council candidate, and he's also the director of marketing for X3 Sports. Now, David is one of those guys who just has lived, it seems like a thousand lives. Um, he's done so much crazy stuff. He's done a lot of traveling, been in a lot of different jobs and positions and titles. And we talked on this episode all about um, traveling around the world. We talked about me actually dropping out of college. We talked about his thoughts on politics, education, why he has the audacity to call himself Mr. Atlanta and how he got his super unique style and so much more. This is an amazing podcast. I definitely need to have David on again because I feel like there's still so much that we have to talk about. But um, please enjoy this episode. Without any further ado, welcome my friend, Mr. David Orland Brown. David Orland Brown, what's up, dude? What's going on, Andrew <laughs> Dice? So for the people who are just are just tuning in, they have not been in this room with us. We just did some kundalini breathing exercises to start this off. That's the that's the first for this podcast for sure. Interesting. First time we've ever done kundalini breathing right before. Good. Yeah, it's very important. Um, basically what we did was a deep vinyasa breathing exercise. We did three minutes breathing into our stomachs, focusing on our third eye with our hands up like this, <laughs> deep belly, belly breaths. You just go right back into it for like two minutes yeah, right. <laughs> and I just sit here like, I need five minutes, so I'm going to keep going. <laughs> but, and what you do is you pump oxygen throughout your body, resetting your nervous system, cleansing your pituitary glands, and truly helping cure different ailments, mental, physical. It can do a lot of things. And that's pretty much what Tony Robbins does is a deep breathing yeah. exercise and incantations before he does any kind of public speaking. I just listened to a podcast with Joe Rogan and Laird Hamilton. He's like a pro surfer and he has like he, he's super about like breath work and stuff too. Same with like, uh, he's like friends with Wim Hof too, the Iceman guy who does all the breathing stuff too. Do you know who he is, Wim Hof? Elaborate. He's crazy. He, um, he's like hiked Mount Everest with no shoes on. He like swims in into like frozen ice lakes and swims in a little hole, swims like a hundred yards and then pops back up. He'll, he'll like do all this crazy stuff, but it's all about breath for him. Like that's how he creates heat inside the body. But he always is. He, he was on. He's he's been on a bunch of podcasts. I'm pretty sure I've listened to him with Tony Robbins. Probably Tony, maybe Tim Ferriss, Joe Rogan. He's been on a bunch of those types of podcasts too. Um, How long but, can he hold his breath? I can't remember, but it's a long time. He can hold his breath for a long time. But not only that, he can deal the his ability to deal with cold, like his ability to like d just mentally not like fr freeze. You know, like the, he said that when he um he did this one ice plunge. He said his, his uh, eyelids were freezing over and he couldn't see. Jeez. It's like, what at what temperature and how long are you staying in an ice bath for your eyes to literally freeze, dude? Because, I mean, think about it. Your eyes are like mostly water. Right. So his eyeballs were freezing. 
literally becoming ice. I haven't even heard of that. Like, I think mean, about that. Like, if you dipped, like, a, you know, an, an eyeball into, like, liquid nitrogen or something, it would eventually freeze. Like, that's what happened. That was what was happening to his actual eyeballs. Because he was doing it with no goggles. He was just oh, swimming. Wow. It's ridiculous. But anyways, dude, David Orland Brown. We we officially just met this past weekend on Saturday. And uh, you're, you're, uh, you have a new podcast coming out, right? The Mr. Atlanta podcast. Correct. Right? Sir. So how did you come up with, how, how did you earn the title of Mr. Atlanta, I guess? Or, or how did you, who, who bestowed that? What's the story behind the Mr. Atlanta thing? Well, uh, thank you for asking. And <laughs> I'll pretty much say the reason I have the capacity or the audacity <laughs> and the audacity to call myself Mr. Atlanta is because it had happened so many times. I've hosted over 10,000 groups between one and eight people wow. via Airbnb and my company Stay ATL and Couchsurfing when it initially started with that back in 2008. And so after, I don't know, three, four, five years, people after so many times here, and you know what, David, you, you have the keys to the city. You're, you're Mr. Atlanta. He said, you know what? Fuck that. Yes, I am. And nobody else was calling themselves that. Nobody. I did my diligence, searched around, looked for it, and decided why not. And I did that right before I announced my campaign into Atlanta City Council District 5. And uh, that was when I was transitioning from branding my company, myself, and then the campaign page on top of a location page in Edgewood Avenue and other ventures that I've pursued. And so that's, um, that's really where it came from was not my connections or wealth or you know being the best in the city, because I'm not, I'm not any of those, but I have the keys through hospitality, truly showing people the beautiful, amazing things about Atlanta since 07 when I was a 18 year old freshman in Georgia State living in downtown when it was shitty. When it wasn't booming, it was not safe to go out after 5 p.m. because everything literally closed down. And it's beautiful what Georgia State has done over the last 12 years in that area and all around. Georgia being the seventh largest school in America, biggest in the state with a 69, maybe probably 72,000 undergrad. And so really that's it, being in the trenches, learning, experiencing, and connecting with so many people and walks of life. So one of this, uh, the most beautiful examples was about three months ago, uh, my friend Caroline Bastos texted me about coming to this party with her girlfriend and some, some other friends. And she's somebody I had hosted at my uh, 121 8th Street apartment between Juniper and Peachtree, right there on 8th in the middle of Midtown. And that's where I had a three bedroom, one bathroom, Jack and Jill bathroom, <laughs> little apartment that I started really, really hosting. And um, hundreds, it, it was before that also. In so for people that don't know like couch surfing and all that, like, so it, it, was, it was mainly couch surfing or was it also Airbnb that you were doing at the time? Yeah, great question. So it, it all started from couch surfing. That's where the passion and correct me if I'm wrong, Couchsurfing is basically a website where you can kind of offer up a couch for just anyone to stay on that's willing, that wants to, you know, maybe they're traveling through or, you know, it's, it's typically a lot of young people, right? And it's, uh, you know, instead of a hostel or something, there's not very many of those in America. So Couchsurfing kind of becomes the option, right? Absolutely. And it's the Facebook of traveling, essentially. Mm. It was the first form of that before Airbnb. Um, and there were ways that you could get verifications, people who were early, early adapters. And I, and I went out of my way to do that. Um, my college girlfriend, Rebecca Rossetti, was hosting this group of people in, in a attic loft with three other, three roommates. And I was like, what is this? I've got to do it. And I was on a hospitality trip, actually, with Club Managers Association of America, CMAA at Georgia State which is the only chapter in the state of Georgia. So we got a lot of attention and a little bit of funding to go on these trips. And I was in Orlando for that. And this is my sophomore year in college said, you know, air train news is only 69 bucks. I can go to Chicago and have my flight paid back home for free. Wait, air train you? Is yes, it sir. it's like a college discount or something? 18 to 22 euros. I believe it's it's gone now. Yeah, I was gonna say. 
I don't. E- I don't even know if AirTran is a thing anymore. Is it? I don't even see AirTran that much. Is it around? I believe it's still around. It's I don't definitely know. I could not be wrong, performing but I, like. Yeah, I could be wrong, Delta, but I feel like now Southwest. it's like Southwest is oh, like the main yeah. thing. Because well, AirTran used to be like all in the Southeast and stuff. I haven't thought about AirTran in a minute. I could be totally wrong. I could be talking on my ass here, but. I'm I'm decently looking at flights. You yeah, know, not to give bit. a plug for yeah, AirTran yeah, because it was a lot of shitty AirTran. missed flights and connections. <laughs> so but it was, so that's was what it I was like, doing. Was it? And I was gonna go to New York, but it would only go to Chicago from Orlando. Oh, and gotcha. So okay, okay. I already had the first two flights taken care of, and I went there. I stayed with three different hosts in three different parts of the city. Um, have you ever been to Chicago? I haven't actually. It's oh, one of the, the main Midwest, major cities brother. I've never been to. It's the south of. <laughs> The Midwest. I mean, truly hospitality, like people that will take the time to get to know you. And and uh, the big, the biggest difference between New York and that, they're both huge metropolitan cities. There's no uh, city with more skyscrapers in, in America behind Chicago and in New York. And so I wanted that experience. I stayed with these three different guests uh, off of West Grand Ave um, and garden oaks around wrigleyville and then up in evanston and i still stay in contact with these guys now and actually they do amazing things traveling and um, we did some badass stuff we broke into the trump international hotel and pretended like we were guests and got shown around and and you know that was all through couch surfing for free these people hosted me and sure like i bought the drinks when we were out for a round or here and there and, yeah that's kind you of know, like kind of pays, accepted yeah, a little bit you know yeah. it's like it just pay it forward and so i talked i brought that back to atlanta and took it to scale and then found so much passion in that that i incorporated a small business stay in atlanta limited liability corporation and because airbnb i was able to rent out that same couch i was doing for free for 50 bucks taking that to the room for 100 then 150 and i really learned how to monopolize the market in certain pockets of the city really early on especially because atlanta like surprisingly does not have a huge airbnb like selection like when you when you look yeah the supply is low for airbnbs in atlanta which is kind of interesting because you'd think you know it's pretty it's a big city. It's a major city, but like, what's the deal? What's going on? What gives? How many people travel here? <laughs> That's true. That's very true. And also the same thing with like hostels. It's like, you know, in, in a lot of European cities, like there's so many hostels. It's amazing. Like you just go there and you can stay for like 20 bucks a night. Maybe Absolutely. maybe you're bunk mates with some smelly guy, but you might be bunk mates with some cute Australian girl or something too. You never know. Like, you know, it, it it's it's a hit or miss at all those types of places, but I mean, I've had really good luck staying in hostels for sure. Yeah, I think hostels have got kind of a negative connotation mm. with the usage, unfortunately, um, because in Europe there is none really kind of uh, association, negative or positive, with it's just a word, hostel. And so yeah. if you Google search that, you're going to find a bunch of places. I've stayed anywhere from six euros a night to, to 15 or 20. I'm, I'm pretty yeah. cheap when I travel. And uh, they were amazing. I met t- people with whom I traveled and helped get me affiliated in Spain when I was like fresh. You know what's funny is I've found the cheaper ones are typically you find the cooler people. Facts. Because Facts, the more brother. expensive ones are people that are like, Ew, I don't want to stay in here. I don't even want to be here. Yeah. And now I'm here, so why do I want to associate with you rather than the people that are budgeting and, and you know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like people that are like staying in the five dollar one are gonna be way cooler than the people staying in the you know fifty dollar one or whatever. Because it's like you know you're 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 trying to make the most out of your trip. Because it's, it's also community. like it's love, you know, it's it, shared love yeah. and, and community. And and I've I actually stayed. I um, quit the last law firm at which I was working um, as a sole practitioner, criminal defense. I've been a paralegal for about eleven years off and on and um, I have a true passion for the law and uh, I was just getting work to the bone so I saved up some money and um, traveled I, I literally next day hopped on a mega bus for like 12 or 18 bucks those are so clutch sometimes to Richmond Virginia and then uh, I always clutch and then got to DC from there um hosteled it actually nice. at two different places over four nights and um, just explored around because I've been to DC twice, but never really had a time to go around or party. And and birds were just coming out, mm. really getting in huge lime and bird selection. So I was 
really getting to experience that city, um, which was great. And then I t- I went up to New York after, and it was just it was so much fun just jumping like that. That's awesome, dude. I feel like we I feel like you you've shared so many like awesome little stories. Let's go back for a second and and tell me about your like you know your upbringing and all that kind of stuff. Where do you where were you born? How did you how did you get to where the David Orland Brown is today? Give us the cliff notes of that. Well, thanks for asking, and you are an exceptional host. This is amazing. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. So <laughs> yeah, so I was born in Gwinnett. I uh, grew up in Gainesville. Where did you go to school? I went to McEver Elementary. Chesapeake Middle and High, which is Chesapeake you know High, is? no Northeast Georgia, no, because I because I went to Norcross High School. Mm-hmm. I was I grew up in Gwinnett County too, but more on the the like corner, like the bottom corner, you know. Right. Yeah, which is you know a lot faster. It's yeah. So much more metropolitan, and a lot has changed in the past ten years, even ten fifteen years. There, you know, lots of lots of you know immigrants moving in there lots of uh tons of like asian population tons of korean stuff being built up there like it's there's certain parts of gwinnett um you know you go you go there and like all the signs are in korean or japanese or whatever it's it's really cool actually you know i love it but yeah a lot's changed but you know obviously i think the more culture you can pack into an area like that's cool because a lot of a lot of gwinnett uh you know before that was a lot you know businesses were going out a lot of abandoned stuff and now these new you know people are coming in taking over the old leases and all that kind of stuff and bringing new life to it so i think it's awesome I but love it. and it's good always food. been a melting pot for sure truly and it's and honestly i i've even heard um because at norcross there is a <laughs> there was a lot of um a lot of a lot of mexican students there and and they would they talked about how like Gwinnett County was almost kind of like famous in parts of Mexico. They were talking about how like they, how like Gwinnett County was the spot to go to if you if you came to Georgia. Like yeah, move to Gwinnett. Like really? it's got it's a good spot to move to. Like Ooh. people people were like yeah they they told they cool some with people that. were telling I mean, me it's that a, it's a, I could be totally wrong if you're not talking about my I know talking a lot about, about Gwinnett, but, sir, and you were very very right on and and it's uh korean it's vietnamese yeah it's, it's true it's so many different types of yeah cultures. it's a melting pot for sure um but, but so yeah we moved from gwinnett when i was six gotcha. um, my whole family's from louisiana my parents moved to the sunbelt states right before i was born for job opportunities um and so i grew up in gainesville from pretty much six to 18. gotcha and lived right between 400 and 985 and I had to drive 25 minutes one way to get to middle and high school, which was interesting. But, um, you know, we we're very involved with the lake and the water and, and the pools. I, I got into nice. swim team at five years old and swam until I was 16. I was the uh, third fastest swimmer in the state of Georgia. Damn. At 16. That's awesome. For the breaststroke and fifth Ooh. for the freestyle. Nice. Breaststroke's an interesting one because a lot of people that gravitate towards the fast stuff are either like free or butterfly, you know. Mm-hmm. Like breast and uh, back are kind of the the right, the weird ones you swim? a little bit. I used to swim swim team. Okay. I didn't do it in high school, but up until high school, I was on a swim team. Yeah, we'll definitely dive into swim life. <laughs> um, dive, dive, oh, baby boy. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Punny. <laughs> It just happens. It happens. It happens. So yeah, I um, <laughs> I grow up. I how far away were you from Tennessee? Like how how close? How far of a drive was far it? Far enough to not frequent it. I mean, it's like an hour, like f- four or five hours. It's just one hour northeast of Atlanta. Oh, Gainesville. okay, okay, okay. All it's county. not too okay, okay, not too mm-hmm. crazy then. And so I moved yeah, to Gainesville. Atlanta not, at eighteen, and really immersed myself. I didn't want to go where all my my friends growing up went, which was UGA, North Georgia, or Gainesville State. And uh, I got into UGA, I got into all those schools I mentioned, but I wanted to go to Georgia State. And I got really admissioned and said, fuck it, I'm going to the city. I want that, I need that in my blood. And then I also had a friend who was a pie cap at Alabama who introduced me to some pie caps at Georgia State, who rushed me at like 18 years old and took me to these parties and introduced me to these people. And so I already kind of knew I was like, this is it for me. Like, nice. I'm gonna go in the city, and I did, and it was the best decision I could have made because I lived with one of my best friends, Grant Russell, off of Buford Highway the first two and a half months, and it was 
not that great of circumstances. Not glamorous. The, his sister was bringing in straight cats who were shitting on the wall. It was a 40, 50 minute commute to downtown. I was working at the Marriott, going to state. How did they shit on the wall? Did they just scoot their butts against the wall and shit? You tell me, sir. <laughs> how, how did, did they throw their shit? <laughs> they like claw into the wall and then just like poop on the wall like 30 yeah, feet, bro, like 10 feet up. Yeah, bro, it was this place off of Beaver High. There's a lot of straight cats and she had a big heart and she just wanted to take these cats in. And I, okay. and I said, it's just not for me. So I went on Craigslist, found this girl named Elizabeth work and she, her and my mom had happened to work together doing makeup having to work together yeah my mom's work. an esthetician a I makeup work. artist I'm work. being stupid work. pun work. No, said Elizabeth work work and work. I said they there work they work fun. together yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. not a pun okay sorry I'm ruining the no, podcast no, it's not. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I got, I got I'm bouncing like a bad check boom boom <laughs> work was it worth it let me work it <laughs> Sorry, I'm, to the I'm, 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 I'm derailing this. I'm derailing this train, this story train. So Elizabeth works. You work with your mom, mm -hmm. you said right. And so Craigslist was still kind of weird in 06, 07. Um, yeah. But I hopped on it and I found her and got to stay at the Muses, which is literally at 50 Peachtree Street in the middle of Five Points. Nice. <laughs> the center of downtown. Mm -hmm. And for three years, I lived there. Um, first three years of college and it was interesting my car was six blocks away and a parking deck and i got broken <laughs> into four times oh, geez. Uh, you know i got booted and towed and ticketed more times than i can count never paid a parking ticket know how to get out of those really yeah definitely you said you were paralegal so you maybe had some ins there absolutely nice there's ways to dispute a park atlanta or now eto plus parking ticket and um, on my website, on your website, I'll give you the info to share with your people how to how to do this because it's something that there you we know, go. Everybody needs to know. Like if you get a flat tire from hitting a a pothole, a, a pothole or a metal plate, mm. you can get the city of Atlanta reimburse you for that. Really? Absolutely. That's sick. Absolutely. Wish I would have known that once because I got a flat tire from a pothole. Only well, knew now. Yeah. And all your viewers do. There we go. All you out there, free knowledge. Boom, boom. So, um, so you said you you know you were living in the heart of Atlanta, getting your car broken into all that, um, and you said that was you lived there for like three years, so mm -hmm. like pretty much the rest yeah, of college. My first two years, nine months, and then um, then I did a bike ride. Well, I guess in my first year from San Fran to DC for people with first mental, year of college. Yeah, my first summer. So what? How did that even happen? Because I mean, it, I, you I, sorry, I kind of interrupted you before you said it. It's from San Fran to DC. And how, how many days did that take you? 67 days. 67 days, biking across America. That's not a like normal thing for people to undertake. So how the fuck did you even get roped into that? You know, like, because yeah. obviously it's for a good cause, right? Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's for a good cause. No, you're just like, it was like Forrest Gump. I don't know. I just feel like running. <laughs> I just feel like biking. <laughs> just felt like pedaling. <laughs> Kept on pedaling. <laughs> Kept on pedaling. And I'm going to go home now, or whatever he says. <laughs> yeah, I just went on back. <laughs> so um, the fraternity Pi Kappa Phi has an event called Journey of Hope, mm. uh, also the ability experience. Pi Kappa, one of the reasons I joined is because they represent people with disabilities. Push America, which stands for play units for the severely handicapped. Um, name has been changed to the Bill Experience has this program and I have a sister with an extra chromosome. And so I wanted to raise awareness about this my whole life and you know she was able to take speech classes and go through therapy and and get rid of her speech impediment wow and, and not be able to tell really whatsoever looking at her She's wow that's amazing smart accomplished phlebotomist how many, how many um siblings do you have one younger sister okay gotcha how many years apart are you three and a half okay it's like me and my brother so gotcha so she was was she uh well yeah i was gonna say because like the thing about me and my brother is we were three and a half but we were always, like, I was, like, a senior when he was in eighth grade in high school. So we never were, like, in the same school together, really. But I didn't know. Kind of the same for Caitlin and I. Um, except I was held back in the kindergarten. Gotcha. Because I'm an August baby, August 21st. Mm. So right at the beginning of the school year. And my So instead mom, of being the youngest in the class, you want your mom wanted you to be the oldest in the class, pretty much. Right. And yeah. she thought I had ADHD and put me on Ritalin and Adderall oh, wow. at a young age. How young? Kindergarten. Wow. Yeah. Damn. W looking back on that, do you feel like that would, you know, obviously, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. but do you think that like affected your like development or how you like viewed, 
you, you know, that's an interesting thing. Thousand percent. About, yeah, it helps. It, it affects your view Any on drugs. Any person who would say no would be in doubt. Yeah. <laughs> or lying. Yeah, because I um I forget who it was. I think it was um. Is the singer for uh, Black, or not the singer for Black Flag, I can't remember what his name is, he was on Rogan's podcast and he was talking about that too, how he was on Riddle at a really young age and um, he said it, you know, it definitely affected him for sure. Absolutely. But, I mean, obviously you, your mom was just doing what she thought was best, you know. Yeah, it wasn't like you she know, was, she kinda... was uh, part of this whole baby boomer society that got coerced into thinking that they needed to have these crutches yeah. for kids when they, really they were just hyper and they're just kids. Just and and kids. so, you know, that, that had good and bad effects on my life. I was an honor roll student in the honor classes, um, never really had to study, always strive with school, did multiple sports. I wasn't very coordinated, so I didn't do the team sports like baseball and basketball. I tried out for the teams and didn't make them, uh, but still stuck with swim team, cross country, wrestling. I got into that young. And so that taught me a diligence um, mm. in a unique way. Cross country and, and running, like cross country was one I did in middle school. And I remember that one's way more mental than people would assume. Facts. Absolutely. I mean, most sports are more mental than you'd assume too. You know, it's like with cross country, it's like, it's not super, it's a, it's a long race, but it's not that long, you know, it's like, but, but to be able to keep going when, you know, you're passing other people and you're kind of like, ah, I could slow down a little bit or, you know, there's a hill and you're like, ah, oh, fuck. Like, but you, you know, you power through, like, those are the moments it's amazing. that, you know, that you can't really teach that. You got to experience that. Facts, brother. Yeah. And to piggyback on that, I went and ran my cross country trails this past weekend through Memorial Day. Went to Gainesville High School, did around the track, tennis courts, and lake over there. Was and that pretty high nostalgic school. for you? Um, not as much as I thought it would be. It was kind of just cool to go own those those courses that I ran in the past and get to re-experience how I felt back then. Mm. Um, because I'm still, I'm always trying to find the deeper reason of why I want to do this. And I'm on this big running kick. Mm. Uh, I'm, trying, I'm trying to get in as best shape as I can. Yeah. I've lost 24 pounds in the past five months. And um, damn, nice you know, job, bro. Thank you, thank you. And that's been from this working out, uh, plant-based diet. But back to the, the Adderall. Um, so I got off of it in ninth grade, going into high school. I was like, you know wow. what? Um, I want to grow and have so better social own, skills. that was your own decision kind of like over the years. You're like, I want to. Yeah. And I was like, mom's like, I got to get off. She's, she, my mom's cool, you know? And so I stopped taking it throughout high school, which was nice because I definitely had my growth spurt. Not really. Had more of an appetite. Late. More probably. of an appetite. Was, uh, A little more outgoing, maybe. Much more outgoing. Started to develop my, uh, my, my my social skills, truly, yeah. because I was very much more of an introvert growing up through elementary and and uh, middle, and, and especially because where my parents' house is located geographically. And so I had to uh, utilize like MySpace and things like that, yeah. and and I got into that early, which was which was interesting. Um, but got off the pills, got into college, and was like, "Fuck, actually, I need Adderall again <laughs> to study for these tests." And uh, then I found out about Vyvanse, and so I got prescriptions and took it in college and have been off it for about nine months. Um, off, off and on before that, I gave up all drugs and alcohol June 4, 2015, um, kind of on my own little spiritual personal journey. Nice. And, yeah, I was wondering um, if you went to like a proper rehab or something, but it was just your own kind of... yeah. Yeah, I decided I'd hit my low. I got fired from the first law firm at which I worked with my mentor, number one mentor to this day, Chad Trinacosta. And he was the guy who schooled me up in law. Mm. Um, he knows everything about criminal defense, and he's the best attorney and, and mentor that I've had the honor and privilege of knowing. And so he fired me, and I said, fuck my habits. I've got to get, I've got to get things together, and I did. Nice. I quit everything. I started smoking marijuana six months through. Uh, my sponsor, my higher power, were in accordance with it. Um, I was going to AA and going through the steps. And I didn't have a sip for two and a half years. And wow. really haven't been drunk since. I'll drink now. And, you know, I had a few with y'all this weekend. And, and it, it's been nice because, honestly, I'll get real for your podcast. People, people uh, excluded me. In a lot of ways, they're like, "Oh, the sober guy," you know. Um, it is kind of weird being the being the sober guy sometimes because I I've had my own kind of moments where I, um, 
for example, I went to Georgia College in Milledgeville for one year, <laughs> and uh, I was I was rushing a uh, fraternity. So basically, what happens in at Georgia College is they for the guys they actually don't let you rush a fraternity until your second semester there because they want you to focus on getting your routine, mm-hmm. getting your studies down. A lot all of that schools kind of do stuff. that, and I don't know if I completely agree with it. What do you think? I don't know. It, it it made it was good for me because that immediate pressure to like join something wasn't really on the table. It was more like you know because of course you still had that experience. You were still allowed to go to parties. You were still you know they were still kind of like checking everybody mm-hmm. out. It was yeah, like yeah. informal rush kind of you know. But so by the time second semester rolls around, you already kind of know everybody and you already kind of know which ones you're probably going for. So it's kind of nice. And the fact that it's like a hard rule and it's not just like a suggested thing. You know, because if it was suggested, no one would do it. Right. So, Absolutely. and it's kind of interesting because the girls, they don't have that. Like, the girls rush right off and they mm. show up a couple weeks mm. early, do the whole thing. And so, it's kind of cool because the girls are already all involved. So, you end up getting invited to that stuff anyways. And then, the you know, and then you have your thing later. But anyways. Was that impressionable upon you? The That time in your life? That year? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because oh, yeah. I, cause I dropped out of college after that. I didn't ever go back to college. Never yeah, finished. I was listening to some of your podcasts. Yeah. You were lightly talking about that. Why did you do that? Um, To make a long story short, I'll, I'll actually finish what I was saying about the fraternity thing because it kind of plays into it. So what happened was I was rushing a fraternity, um, and I wasn't I, – I, I was like – it was kind of one of those things where I'm like, I don't know, but a lot of my friends were doing it and a lot of my friends were rushing the same one. And so I was like, okay, let's let's go into this and let, let's do this. And what ended up happening is right around that same time or actually a little bit before that, Which I got um, Delta Sig. Okay. Yep. And uh, I almost forgot. You know, Clayton <laughs> Grabeel? No, I, name doesn't ring a bell. But, um, but uh, what right happened before. was, so what happened was is... Uh, when it came down to uh, Rush, I was involved in this company at the time. It was a multi-level marketing company. I just got invited. My friend Brett or my friend Blake Grouse um, asked or uh, got me involved in this company. And it was, uh, it, it, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with MLM companies, but I'm, oh, I'm sure oh, you've, yeah. yeah, I'm sure you've been exposed to quite a few over the years. Lots of college kids get involved in them. Um, you know, the promise of making a lot of money with your friends, you know, you sell some products, you get some people on your team and you build this empire and you're gonna be driving a free BMW or whatever. And I was involved in the company actually for a couple of years and it taught me a lot. Um, It's the first time I ever, you know, went out on a limb and did something for myself kind of, you know, it was like, it was like everything else had always been kind of steered by society or by my parents or by what everyone else was doing. Kind of, you know, even with college, it was like I didn't really know why I was there, but it was like it was the thing to do. I didn't get into UGA, GCSE was my second choice. And, you know, I kind of just did it and just was going along with the motions. You know what I mean? I never really given much thought to it. It was just like what a, what you're supposed to do. Go to college, get good right. grades, get a good job, get, you know, all that kind of stuff. So anyways, to go back to the fraternity thing, when it came down to rushing – I was also like really religious at the time too and I wasn't 21 and so I was like basically they they, they said right at rush they were like if you're gonna drink you gotta drink through rush and if you're not gonna drink you're not allowed to have a sip because because we're all under 21 you know obviously it's you know it's illegal is that a fraternal or school-wide thing it was a fraternal thing they're basically like we'll respect it if you choose not to but you can't just choose to not when you want and do when you want. I mean, each fraternity or just yours. They, oh, it was just ours. Like, this okay. is just what they told us. They were like, everyone, you got to tell us right now if you're sober or not, because we're not going to force anything on you. But but tonight we're going to have a party and we're going to drink a lot. And you can't just choose like, oh, well, I'm sober, but I'll have a beer too. It was like, we're getting you drunk or you're not drinking at all. So what was your so, pledge class so percentage? Me and my, oh, it was me and my other buddy were the only two that chose to be sober, everyone else. And our so pledge smart, class was bro. like 30-ish. So it was like decent size. Or was that smart, do you think? So here's the thing. It was it ended up being smart for me um, because what happened was, was me and Brett, it was Blake's brother, the dude that got me into into this company, Vima. It was me and it was Brett, and he was also in the company. So it was like me and him were both in this company together. We're both trying to build this business together. We're both the only two sober guys. And we're both the only two like people that would actually call themselves. Well, I, I would say some of the guys in that group definitely called themselves Christians, but like we were like 
we were like, we're going to set the good example, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a little bit holier than thou, but also I was like, I don't want to be forced to like binge drink and all this stuff and, and like, you know, anyways. I respect all that. Yeah. So it, it and that was, and, and dude, like actually a lot of the older brothers in the fraternity were like, yo, like I respect the fuck out of that. Cause like most people, it, it, it was way easier to just say I'll drink than to say not way easier Facts. and um it was cool it was cool you know Just and people respected it a little it. bit um no actually like maybe maybe like without the fraternity like maybe me and my roommates or something oh, would yeah, have some something beers like but that. like but it wasn't um something that like i at the parties you're not pulling a flag no or no, ripping a shot. no no because also um rush was like kind of intimidating a little bit too so i didn't want to mess up but the but the interesting thing that happened was is um Basically, there was this one night where they, uh, I don't think I've told the story on the podcast. So this is actually really great. Um, they pulled us into, or if I have, it was a long ass time ago. They pulled us into this room and it was basically, they, they had like these one-on-one -on -one interviews with everyone in our pledge class with, a, with like the president and like the rush chair or whatever, you know, whoever, whatever it was called. And uh, like the vice president or something like that. And they're basically kind of like interviewing you like, so how do you like it? You know, who, you know, blah, blah. And one question they asked was, do you um, feel like any of your pledge brothers aren't pulling the weight or aren't aren't mm -hmm. um, you know as involved or whatever? And um, when I was in the when I was uh, rushing and whatever, I would you know after you know we had our like actual required duties and stuff. I was you know they were always like oh you who who wants to stick around and like play FIFA or like who wants to stick around and you know whatever. And I was always of the mentality of like, dude, I got hella shit to do. Like, I'm trying to run this business. I got to go home and listen to some audio books. I got to take notes. I got to make phone calls. I got to do all this shit. And so I think a lot of the, my pledge brothers took that as Andrew doesn't even want to hang out with us. Like, he's only hanging out with us when it's required that he hangs out with us. You know what I mean? And me in my head, I'm like, dude, this is eating up hella my time. Like, I've, I've got to study on top of this, which I wasn't giving much attention to my studies. Let's be real. I've got to do all this required pledge ship stuff that I just, you know, got myself roped into. And I'm trying to run a business for the first time in my life and I'm losing money at the time. You know, it's like, I'm losing money. I'm having to buy product on a monthly basis and I wasn't making it. So I'm like, I see other people, my mentors in the business that are making money. So I got to do what they're doing. And I was following their lead and I'm like, well, I can't be fucking playing FIFA and drinking beer. Like I need to be doing my shit. So basically, um, I think a couple of the young of my pledge class took that as like Andrew doesn't hang out with us. I don't even know him very well. All that kind of stuff. And I think a couple of people mentioned my name when they asked about is any are any of the pledge brothers not pulling their weight. And um, basically at, that night after the interviews, the the um, rush chair whatever it was called, I don't remember. He came to my dorm. He, he texted me. He said, "Hey, are you a drama?" I said, "Yeah." He said, um, "Hey, you mind if I stop by for a minute?" And um, I said, yeah. And he came by and he was like, hey, man, I, I hate to do this. I, you know, it's not it's not any of the current brothers that did this, but actually your, your pledge brothers had said that they didn't feel like you were, you know, part of it or whatever. And that was a crazy moment for me because um, it was like sobering in the fact that like, damn, you know, these guys don't accept me a little bit. But also at the same time, I think a little bit of it was they were a little bit intimidated of me, some of them maybe, because um, number one, I was like kind of being the sober guy. So they were like, what's the deal with him? Is he trying to be like better than us? Like, does he think he's better than us kind of thing? Like I got that vibe from a couple of the guys. And then also the vibe of he's not hanging out with us. He thinks he, you know, he's trying to run this business. Also, I kind of talked to some of them about it before. So a lot of people knew. And um, cause of course I was like trying to recruit people and stuff, mm -hmm. you know? Oh, yeah. So a lot of them knew and also one guy in particular fucking was trying to sabotage me with the business all the time. Like he, he like looked into it. And he was like, you're running a fucking pyramid scheme and like all that type of stuff. So he was like made it his goal to like shit on it anytime he could. So I think that was kind of part of it. So, so in that moment, I, I like sat down on my bed and I, at the time I was still kind of, you know, really thinking about the, the fraternity thing. Cause I was like, do I really, you know, do I really want to do this? You know, blah, blah, blah. Am I going to stay here all four years? I don't know, but I guess I should. And this will be a good opportunity. And I like these guys. And I, I also had formed a good, really good relationship with some of the older brothers in the fraternity too. So, and I, and, and they were, they were really sad that, that I got dropped. Cause they were like, dude, like I, we didn't have anything to do with this. It was like, you know, but anyways, long story short, 
basically in that moment, I was like, you know what? This is a sign and this is a good thing. And that just means I need to double down on my business, like a hundred percent. Like this is the sign that like, nah, you don't need to like do that. You don't need to party. You don't need to like fuck around. You've got friends, like you've got, you, you need to like hammer down on this business. And so that's what I did, man. And like for the next couple months, I made that my like a hundred percent focus. Love it. And I, you know, I, I uh, had some mentors in the, in the business <clears throat> that came down to GCSU and did home events with us and all this stuff. And um, it came time to like for finals and I had a couple of classes where it was like, um, I had a couple of classes um, that I was almost failing and, or not almost failing, but like I had like a bunch of projects due that I hadn't done. And if I didn't turn them in on the final day, then I was gonna fail. And then a couple of classes where I wasn't doing so hot. And like, if I didn't do good on the final, I was gonna get bad grades. And my parents always told me if I lo- lost the Hope Scholarship that um, they were gonna, you know, say they were gonna, you know, not support me and say that I couldn't go to GCSU and I would need to go to like community college or whatever, you know? Right. And I was thinking at the time, I'm like, well, I can't get bad grades because I'm gonna lose hope and then blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, but do I even wanna be here? And one of my roommates, um, he'd, you know, he'd made some kind of like, I don't wanna say bad life choices, but he hadn't been doing anything, skipping class all the time, playing video games every night, staying up late, playing League of Legends, yelling at the computer, all that kind of stuff. It's like- a great person to be around. (laughs) Right? And and uh, he he um, he was dropping out. Well, he was failing out, and I remember thinking that I was jealous that he was dropping out or he was failing out because he didn't have to come back. And I'm like, I could just not come back and be in the same situation, leave on kind of good terms, also go to sleep tonight instead of st- staying up all night trying to study for these tests that I'm, you know, not gonna probably even do that good on and and try to half-ass these projects that I need to turn in. Or I could just go to sleep and and wake up tomorrow and focus on my business again. Thanks. And that's what I did, man. And um and it took me a minute to like tell my parents because um I was um, embarrassed, you know. I didn't want to tell them, but at the same time, it was like um I knew that ba- I basically I wrote them a letter in this uh, book. And um, in in this little notebook, and I wrote them this letter, basically explaining all my thoughts, so that so that when I had that conversation with them, I could just read the letter to them instead of trying to like articulate all my thoughts, because I knew I'd miss something. So basically, sat them down. I was like, I need to like read you this. Please don't interrupt me until I'm done, basically, because I want to say what I need to say, and then we can talk about it. And um, that was intense, man, because uh, basically the whole letter was kind of about the fact that. You know, I respect college. I respect that my parents both went to college, but in today's day and age, I didn't feel like it was worth it for me. And I felt like I was kind of receiving, like in the sense of getting a college degree, I felt like I was getting a coupon for something I didn't want to buy, right? It was like, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to like own my own business. And like this opportunity over here, this college diploma is a really good opportunity, but all the paths leading out of that was like something I didn't want to go down. So it's like, it doesn't really matter that it's a good, like, like for example, it's a 50% off coupon to, you know, a, a restaurant that I hate. You know, right. it's like, it's like, yeah, it's a good deal. It's 50% off, but like, I, I don't, I don't even want it. Cause I don't even want to pay half. Like, I don't even want to pay anything. Like you, you give it to me for free and I, I kind of still don't want it. You know what I mean? And that's kind of how I felt towards college at that time in my life. And so, um, yeah, man, like that was what I did. Love and, it. um, Thanks for like letting me tell that whole story too, because like sometimes podcast guests aren't always as receptive to like listening to my stories as well. So I appreciate you actually like being interested in that because um, it, it's a cool story and it was like a really important time in my life because I uh, it was like one of the biggest pivots and it was one of the biggest times where I fully recognized that like you know my parents are supporting me, you know they were paying for a lot of stuff, you know. I'm a, I'm a freshman in college, you know, I didn't have a job, I didn't, you know, I didn't have much savings. And so I was fully prepared, like, you know, they might cut me off 100%, they might, you know, disown me, but I was like, per, I was like mentally prepared for that, you know, I was like, I've got a lot of mentors in this business, I got a lot of people around me that'll like, you know, if I need to crash on some couches, if I'm like homeless for a little bit, whatever. And um, I stayed in that business for like two years and I uh, learned a lot and, um, it honestly like shaped me into a lot of like who I am today and like what I what I'm about. So it's pretty dope. Love it. Yeah. 
but strong stuff, dude. Dude, yeah, it's pretty powerful. And um, yeah, I, I I like I like being able to tell that story because I think a lot of people can relate because right. they feel those same feelings, but they didn't have the outlet like I had. Like I was able to put all that energy towards this business that I joined and that I was trying to make happen. And I think a lot of people have that energy towards college but they don't have that secondary plan that they can tr- at least have a glimpse of hope of making it mm-hmm. or something. And so they just stick in the stagnant because that's the only feasible option. It's comfortable. Yeah, and it's comfortable. And, you know, your parents aren't going to get mad at you. College, I think, to a lot of people is just a game of how drunk can I get with and and, and how, uh, how razor's edge can I keep my grades and it's like a game it literally is a game of you know you got the triangle like sleep good grades and and partying you know yeah um, and like how do you balance that triangle you you can only pick two and so it's like you know everyone's trying to somehow stick in the middle and they're always going towards two of the corners so it's hard to get three and stay in that little area yep. where you can hit them all yep yep exactly so yeah, I, I, that's I, I gen- one of my favorite sayings is uh <coughs> to do anything in life it takes capacity desire and vision mm. so capacity can be mentally physically financially emotionally whatever um the desire we all know that are you hungry mm-hmm. or are you not and then the vision is, you know, kind of the kicker. It's uh, a lot of people can have it and have the desire, not the capacity. Mm. Or it's really people have the capacity and the vision, but they don't have the desire. It's They're totally not hungry true. enough to do to drop to drop out of college, make your own business, double down on yourself. Dude, and the what's podcast working. was a big one for me. I think about that a lot because that was another turning point where I felt like I was, you know, just paddling because I was working a job. So living at my parents' house, you know, it was just like, it was just like, you know, I've got all this stuff, but I was just, I just needed something to pour my energy mm. into. And as soon as I like flicked that switch and decided to do the podcast, man, like I launched, you know, uh, 25 episodes in the month of June of 2017. Like, you know, now wow. I'm struggling to get four episodes out a month, like, you know, one a week. I'm like, fuck, dude, I got to get that episode out. That's this how week. it happens. Uh, and, but in the beginning, I was you were hungry, playing multiple. Bro. You were doing multiple per day. I was doing multiple recordings were recording. per day. Yeah, I, I went back in. You know, I went to episode one. Yeah, dude. Before I came on and at least looked at the captions and the who's yeah, been man. on. And dude, I appreciate amazing, the research, man. dude. It's, a lot of people uh, don't don't check out the show, you know, beforehand just because they're you know whatever. But oh, so I was busy or this yeah. or that. Like, it's just really not an excuse, especially in this day and age. Literally, I can say, "Hey Siri, show me the Andrew Dice podcast," and it will go in the podcast app. Like, it'll it'll do that. It's and, true. Um, there's, there's, there's that's no a, dude, excuse. That's, that's such a good point, though, dude. People all the time are like, how do I listen to your podcast? I'm like, literally Google my fucking name. Google my fucking name. Well, that's why hey, I haven't listened hey, yet. It's, it's because like, it's I like, don't know how to find it. You it, have a like, hard spelling like, last name. Like my, my mom's friends and stuff, they're like, oh, Andrew has a show. I've been meaning to ask you how to find it. It's like, did you try even half of a percent? No, right. you didn't. Because you didn't Google my fucking name. Yeah. Like, you didn't. Try and that's all. fine because how many <laughs> other people are googling your name? It's true, man. And it's how true. many different <laughs> you know people are you are you gaining towards this? It's true, man. It is true. You understand the analytics, yeah? Yeah. And you really can't get personal about it. No, um, no, no, it was no, no, one no. of the hardest things no, when I was running for office, not getting the full fledged support of my family. Mm. It was really, really difficult because. I knew that I could make a change. I knew that I could make this place better and use my capacity, desire, and vision. They didn't have the desire. They had the capacity. Maybe they had the vision, but maybe they didn't have the desire. Maybe they didn't have the vision. They definitely didn't have the desire and probably half or a third or none of the vision because, you know. And so, that's yeah, that was, dude, that's a, that's a really good point. I like that capacity, desire, and vision. You're so right. Cause a lot of people have lots of capacity and they don't realize it cause they're spending time doing stuff that they either don't even realize that they're really doing wasting time or whatever, or they, you know, just do, simply don't have a project to pour themselves into. So they just end up spent, you know, using that time wasting away, you know, looking at 
whatever, watching videos. I mean, and I'm not saying that I'm the most perfect person ever. I, I enjoy uh, binging some YouTube videos for, for quite a long period of time as well, but I also make sure I fucking do work, you know? And that's one of the hardest things about, you know, being an entrepreneur, running your own business or whatever, is I have a huge problem with external deadlines. If I don't have an external deadline, like, it's really hard for me to do it. What about your internal deadlines? My internal deadlines, those are really easy to break for me. Because it's like, oh, I'm going to put this podcast out on Monday. What's going to happen if I don't? Nothing. You know, I'll be, like, mad at myself, but, like, not that mad. But if I'm going to let somebody down and someone needs my video, they know I'm editing a video or something, and they need it by Monday, and I don't deliver it on Monday, I'm letting down that person. And so those are the external deadlines that I end up really focusing on and then I end up letting down my internal deadlines, not prioritizing those. So that's always a huge balance for me. I've realized that about myself and tried to like really focus on that. Yeah, what past. do you do to stay accountable? Really? Um, well, recently what's been awesome is I've got AJ, my producer, he's been um, working on a lot of our projects and honestly kind of having that fire under my ass of like, dude, I've got this guy, finally. Like, literally, I was looking through my journals um, uh, the other day because I turned 25 on Tuesday. Yes, or yeah, yesterday, yeah, damn. yesterday. And um, I was sitting in the sauna. I woke up real early, went to the gym. I was like, I need to turn over a new leaf. I hadn't been going to the gym for like a couple weeks. Um, but I did go on Saturday before we went to the lake. I'm like, I'm going to be drinking today and eating shitty food. I need to go to the gym if it's the last thing I do. So I went to the gym that morning. But besides that, I hadn't been to the gym in a long time. So I Get woke up on my pump. birthday. Woke up super early, went to the gym, sat in the sauna, and I actually read my journal. Uh, I had this um, like daily planner thing that I uh, started like right at the beginning of when I started my podcast. And I was in, in the journal, it talks about like, what are your five biggest goals for the next one to three years and stuff like that. And two of my goals was uh, quit my job and do the podcast full time, which I now am doing in a roundabout way. I, I make the podcast isn't fully uh, viable right now, but I'm making money through podcast adjacent things and uh, have a, have a, an like a staff member or an employee or whatever that I'm paying to help with the podcast. Those are two of my five goals. And it was one to three years. And so in one year I quit my job and now in two years is the anniversary of the podcast yesterday, two year anniversary. And I, I now have someone that's, that's you know, working working with me, working on my podcast and stuff, which is so dope. How'd y'all link up? Um, we linked up because my brother, my brother knew you and he was like, yo, dude, I've got this friend that I met. I knew his older brother as well. He was like, yo, you know, Austin Clark, his younger brother is um, like really into like film and, you know, uh, cameras and video stuff. Um, and he knew I was looking for someone to, you know, take on some more responsibilities because I was getting swamped. And, um, and, uh, yeah, we, we went to Panera actually right down there, hung out, talked for a bit. And I was like, yo, I think this guy is going to be a good fit for what we're trying to do here. How long ago was that? What? Like a couple months ago, a few months ago. It must have been in like February. Yeah. February, something like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, now we live together, which is crazy. (laughs) We just moved into a house on uh, May 8th or something like that was the moving day. Me and my brother. AJ and uh, another friend, Peter, a, a friend of a uh, friend of AJ's, and now a friend of mine as well. And um, but yeah, it's crazy how how it all comes together. It's but the, but but you know what's funny is my third goal because I've been like kind of discouraged recently about the podcast, and um, mainly it was because I took a uh, like a break, and um, I think I was just letting a lot of negative thoughts get to my head, and I was also not living up to my own potential, and I knew it, and I was like, who am I to like be talking on a podcast? when I'm not even like kind of happy with like who I'm being as a person right now. You know what I mean? Oh, I feel you. And so like the past like few months, I've like kind of gotten my mojo back. I'm like feeling it now. Like, you know what I mean? And you're and, only but, one workout away from a good mood. It's true, man. And uh, the, 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 you know, it's funny is those five goals. It was one, it was like five goals for one to three years. And I remember like in the beginning, I was thinking so much long-term. I'm like, dude, I don't give a fuck. Like, I know this podcast thing is going to take a long time to get off the ground. I know it's probably going to take one, two, three, four years before I even get a solid audience. I don't care. I'm going to make this happen, blah, blah, blah. And I had so much fire and passion. And then, you know, you get to 105 episodes and you're like, I hit 100 episodes. Oh, man, that was a lot. 
what's net like oh man i whoa and so that kind of happened but the but i keep saying this the third goal was to be doing the pot to be making um i to be i i think i said making 10 grand a month with the podcast and that's a pretty ambitious goal but um you know that's 2500 bucks an episode i think i can end up making it happen but you know what's funny is it was one to three years first year quit my job second year now i've got people working on the podcast third year who knows we'll see what happens but anyways i just thought that was kind of cool because i was literally like on my birthday kind of like trying to reminisce and set new goals and that kind of stuff and and that came up so go yeah get on your vision board yeah yeah exactly richard and his sharpies yes yes exactly but um but dude i wanted to get back to um to your story obviously we, we you know you touched on you know running for office you also touched on um you know biking across america but i want to go back for a second because you were kind of talking about how in um high school and stuff you you know you, you got off ritalin and you were like you know finally kind of coming into your own and then you you know you went to college and all that what was that kind of like like you said uh in in high school how did you kind of develop your own like personality and style and stuff like that? Did that come out in college or more like in high school? Cause I can just vibe you. You have like a very like interesting sense of like style and like, you know, just choices. Like you got the freaking fanny pack. Most of the time you've got freaking suspenders on. Like, you know, you got the flow going right now. You got a pink Apple watch, you know, <laughs> like, like you just got like an interesting swag where you're like, I don't give a fuck. You got no shoelaces in your shoes. You know, you're, you're just, you, you got a tattoo on the bottom of your foot. You know, like, like you know, you're, you're just freaking, you're just freaking David Orland Brown. Like, there's no other, oh, stop, there's no stop, other David Brown. Like, there, there's a lot of David Browns, but there's no other David Orland Browns, that's for sure. I so how did that, you, bro. how did you, like, find that style, you know? Because, like, did that happen in co- college, high school, like, Where'd that come from? Ooh, that's that's the money question. And um, really, you hit the nail on the head. It started in ninth grade. Going mm. into ninth grade when I got off of the that roll and um, was really getting into cross country, actually. I had some friends that were uh, doing the summer because everything I did, I did it 100%. I've always been like that my entire life. And with the sports, um, we we were doing that and so i was fortunate that the first year of growing up or um, of going through this high school chastity i was we were the first class to start in sixth grade and go through 12 Mm. all the way through that's kind of cool so was there any upperclassmen yeah but they were either transplants for other school or almost none Mm. Or people that just live nearby. And a lot of Hispanic population, particularly from Mexico and Gainesville's poultry capital of the world. Um, It's been on the top 10. uh, Gainesville is? Gainesville, Georgia. Huh. Yeah, because it has Lake Lanier. It has, uh, you know, Nathan Deal is from there. It's... It's a lot of old money and then new money and then, you know, the diverse, diversity gap is, is huge between rich and poor. Mm. Um, so that was, that was interesting and, you know, we grew up kind of lower middle class and, um, you know, I had to get a job at 15 and, and that's really when everything started clicking. I started making my own money. I started getting friends who could pick me up and, you know, we would hang out together. I was hanging out with, uh, as a 15 year old, like the juniors and some of the seniors and, um, they were all real good to me. Uh, nice. So you were kind of like maturing maybe a little quicker than some of your peers or whatever. Cause you were hanging out with the older kids maybe. Yes. And no, mm. for sure. Definitely. Um, I was, I've always been one to not interrupt and listen and, I'm a true believer in, in philosophy and that the, the listener controls the conversation. And, and so they liked having me around and, um, I was very impressioned upon by them. And, um, I really stopped doing swim team because I wanted to have a life. I was in the pool for, uh, five and a half hours every day before school and after. And, um, you don't get to talk much in the pool either. No, dog. Like, <laughs> no, bro. Hey, that's a great point. <laughs> yeah. You're like, you're, it's a lot of solace. <sighs> it's a lot of just in your own head. And, yeah. and it's, uh, you know, I've listened to Michael Phelps on Tony Robbins podcast twice, um, uh, the past few months. And 
it's tremendous because if you miss one day in swimming, it's like you really miss two days of training and that's what it takes to get back. And so we, we lived like that. Um, and then finally I quit. I was like, I want to have friends. This one guy who was driving me around, Brandon Schweck, we played ping pong together, go wakeboarding, um, eat McDonald's, 50 cents, double cheese, and, you know, start smoking weed and, and ask, was skipping swim team, living life. I have literally zero regrets about it. Because of the geographic region of my house, I utilized the internet and because I was very interested in it. I dove into Windows 95 like it was... Let me go into every single file and folder and understand what this is, why it's here, what the command is. And and I got into MySpace to learn how to do 5H, 5HDP coding or HTML5. <laughs> I was like me. 5HDP is uh, like the some sort of drug. It's not a yeah, drug. It's like, it's like a mood enhancing something, right? We'll talk about that later. Because <laughs> uh, there's, there's ways that you can enhance activities in your life with 5 with, HTTP. With 5 HTTP. Very nice. Um, but so I can relate to the searching through because that's kind of how I was with my first phone. I had an Android phone and I also had an um, iPod Touch before I had a, like a smartphone and I remember I would go through all the settings and like you know go through the accessibility and all the weird little options and like oh I can make the you know uh, you know why is this setting even here? Oh it's for people who like don't have the right dexterity right. to use the phone right. this way or you know oh i can arrange my icons this way or whatever i was i was the same way Love man it. like investigating super deep into which that is kind a lot of, stuff. of what our generation fortunately has been and so that's mm -hmm. why so many people our age kind of question everything mm -hmm. which is something i'm all about you know i'm i have my core principles and i hope most people do but i also hope that they question everything that's out there right now mm. um but so back into kind of what built me into who I am, it was it was making posts like on MySpace that were beautiful and tailored and being a, ahead of the game, but also tenacious and making like different kind of posts and some, you know, uh, questionable, you know, post and um, what kind of questionable? Um, you know, just a little controversial, but always toe the line. My, my nickname uh, growing up, th really through college, was Rick James. <laughs> my buddy Jason Cadena called me a habitual line stepper. Which I still kind of am. <laughs> like you're always stepping over the line? Which is Habitual. Rick James. Ah, uh, that's funny right there. Rick like James, that. bitch. I'm Rick James, bitch. I'll suck with Charlie Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck your couch. <laughs> Just, you know. And, um, and so I took that tenacity and then I got this really great friend group. We're called the Brew Crew. We're still friends today. Um, around 15, 16, a lot of the guys um, were part of my Episcopalian church. We went to Italy and studied in the footsteps of St. Francis and St. Clair of Assisi on a pilgrimage and went to Florence, Vatican, uh, Tuscany, and Azizi, my favorite. And so we made this like little clan, this little group of friends, and we would go to Evan's house, and he had the saline pool, and we would sneak girls out and guys out, and you know everybody would come hang out over here. We, I would be staying over there on the weeknights. Um, I was you know a year older than him, and so I had a 1985 Chevrolet Suburban as my first car. Thank you, Uncle Mark, sent me this from Colorado. It still had studded wheels on it, which I ended up selling to make a little money. And um, so I had this big, like, eight-seater, but really 14-seater vehicle. And I, t I drove everybody. We went to the football games. We, d we came up with this uh, group called the Black Mob. And we had a lot of love and pride for our, our school because we were the first ones going through it. Um, and we, uh, you know, we, we broke a lot of barriers. I was always on the, on the yearbook. And so I was involved with media. You know, I got a Canon DSLR. In my hands at, you know, 14, and um, never put it down. I was very involved in yearbook and drama and as many extracurriculars as I could, and uh, that helped develop me into who I was. I got to what know, was definitely your... push the line saying, like, oh, no, like, I'm skipping class right now for the yearbook. Like, we're, we're creating content for history. Like, are you going <laughs> to get, get in the way of the history? Ah, no. I love that, dude. That's so funny, man. <laughs> it's funny because we were actually looking through some old yearbooks the other day from our middle school because we went to the same uh, private little middle school, and I was on the yearbook team in seventh and eighth grade, which is hilarious, like seventh and eighth grade. But but um, I can uh, I was gonna say, what was your experience like in drama? Because like, for example, 
my mom was always like, you need to get in drama. You're so funny. You're so animated, blah, blah, blah. But I can never like, I don't know, man. Like I tried out for one thing one time and I just couldn't get into it. Like what was the thing that drew you to drama and like how did you deal with it? Like were you, did you love getting on stage or were you like intimidated or what was the, what was your situation? Um, yeah, so my first girlfriend, Megan Parrish, was really into theater through middle school and we started dating that same summer. That's really when things picked up and changed. It's funny enough when I quit the fucking an yeah, amphetamines that were prescribing my whole life and started really expanding and calling my friends and like saying like, let's hang out more. And so I met this girl, Megan. We were together for like two years and um, she was really involved in theater and got me to take one class. I fell in love with it, ended up taking two or three for the rest of high school and um, was in a lot of different plays and had a lot of fun with it. And we also got to kind of, you know, have this different kind of learning that's not just apply through books. And, you know, my platform running for, for city council is education reform, criminal justice, and mass transit. And that's really passionate in everything I do still today. Uh, teach kids about money, financial literacy at an early age, mm -hmm. financial independence, how to create bank accounts, incorporate businesses, <laughs> LLCs, trademarks, just little things. And and holistically have them not eat the food pyramid which is the worst in the world you know plant-based and 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 not you, not not be put on these these pills which have been pumped through pharmaceutical companies for so long and we've been educated to to live this way and eat this way and consume this way so that was my biggest plot my biggest point of of number one that's really interesting, man. Like, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of people think it's kind of like conspiracy of all that kind of stuff. Like, especially back in the day, like the Rockefeller Corporation pumped a lot of money into the education system because they pretty much wanted like a whole population of, you know, almost like slave labor that would just get pumped through uh, elementary school, middle school, and then college and then end, end up working for them. And they didn't want anyone to question anything or know how to start a business or know anything about finances because if they did know, then that's a disadvantage to them because they want an army of workers, not an army of like thinkers or whatever. And that's the kind of whole like conspiracy of it. Do you think that's, that will ever change? Do you think like that there will be, absolutely. you know, in the future? It's already changing. I hope so. It's changed for the worse in a lot of places. Yeah. Atlanta. Being, yeah. being a big, big um, X3 foundation, which is the uh, philanthropy for X3 Sports, the company at which I work, um, works at the John Lewis Invictus Academy in the west side off of uh, Donald Lee Howell in Bankhead, Mine nice. City. Nice. And um, I, funny enough, was a mentor in the Big Brothers Big Sister program my first three years in college. At uh, Grove Park Elementary School, this kid named Deshaun, and he, uh, you know, it, it showed me the education system in a lot of ways and ways it was, it was flawed. Mm. This is when Atlanta was still really in poverty and was shitty and there was a lot of bad things going on and the, the cheating scandal hadn't been busted yet, like when I started. And it was funny meeting Matt Westmoreland when I'm running for office, like before I even announced my campaign. Or I guess right after and having coffee with him and talking about it when he was on the board of education and helping fix all that, all the fucking principals yeah. and, and teachers that had to get fired and the ones, you know, the, the 13 that got criminally charged and, and, and uh, you know, deservingly so punished because they disabled so many people. They truly wow. disabled so many students from, there's still students that I'm working with today with the foundation that were out of the causation of this scandal that don't really know how to read or write and they're still just getting passed through because got to still get funding it's easier to pass them than not you know and it's and it's kind of it's yeah and that's countywide that's state yeah. that's countrywide it's systemically awful in georgia mm yeah going not back everywhere though not everywhere there's, there's, there's a lot schools, of like the, some of the best schools so and I'll say I'll say Atlanta. And it's kind of like, you know, Gandhi said, kind of like, be the change you want to, you know, see in the world. It's kind of like, you know, if you're a teacher and you think that the education system is fucked up, like, you got to kind of be a catalyst. Like, you got to, you know, and, I, and obviously it's Also, don't blame a lot of those teachers because they were trying to get money for pencils. Yeah, literally. And have been negated and neglected by the city for 
their tenures, their whole times. Yeah. So you know, it's a, it's a, it's a wicked double edged sword, and that's why that was the biggest part of my my platform. The second was criminal justice. Um, getting people out of the cycle of recidivism, repeat arrests, petty offenders for marijuana charges makes up 80% of the Fulton County population and, and That's uh, crazy, in man. the prison and in the municipal center. And um, it's just ridiculous. You think that's changing soon too? Yeah, yeah. It that's seems like that's it been is. already shifting, fortunately. And that, that's really uh, countrywide, statewide. Uh, yeah. That the, the, Vi- the nonviolent offenders are, are yeah, stuck non- in this revi- you know that you get put on probation. It, it's ridiculous. Absolutely, and you can, you know, cob count on being busted. Mm. You know, go on vacation, leave on probation. Florida, or Georgia, wherever. There's a lot of places like this. Um, being a paralegal, I got immersed in this. I even had my own legal troubles early on, and so Chad helped me get through that. You know, I understood early. If you have a great attorney, you can beat it easy. Stupidly, do you think ridiculously? Th- but if you don't, you're fucked. Do you think that that's kind and of like don't. part of the system too? Like oh, you know, yes. like that's it. That getting is the, the lower income people into a prison because they know they, you know, they know it's a bullshit charge, but they also know they don't have the right attorneys or the, you know, they don't, they they know they can't get out of it or whatever. Facts. Think about this. Ooh, why do you think Brian Kipp's pushing this anti-abortion bill in Georgia? Mm. They want to keep a certain type of people. And prevent another. Yeah. And it's truly terrible. It's sickening. Mm-hmm. And um, do you think it's also that's like... That's why people like Flint, Michigan still doesn't have water. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking right, dude. That's crazy when you think... You're right, though. And do you also think that... Uh, we're kind of jumping all over the place, but do you kind of think also the abortion thing is like kind of how the social justice warrior type person is a lot of the time flexing their uh, PC muscles just to seem like a better person PC. on the other side, uh, politically correct. Like they're trying to be so inclusive that it almost flips around where like Brian Kemp is trying to be like so conservative, so Christian that he's trying to do the most, you know what I mean? Like to flip people that to way. Flip people that, and, and it's kind of like, it's kind of like anything, you know, it's like it, AOC is like trying to push this green bill where, you know, sh- swinging so radically one way. And a then, stay on camp. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but just, just as a, you're right. Yeah. 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 That it's is, like, that is exactly what he's doing. I love he's it. You're swinging woke, completely brother. the That's other great. way. He's so trying to get in the George's, middle, maybe exactly to just get them as radically opposed to it when they've never really been systematically and he knows that he's not going to win. It's going to get vetoed in the long term. Yeah. Hopeful to God because I marched this weekend yeah. before Saturday and um, you know I took a lot of great video with that and I, I can't wait. I brought my steady cam out there. I think Kemp is just flexing to do this and create as much movement and traction also garnish attention from Trump and respect it into this movement and um and then like, he's just gonna because he's being pro on marijuana yeah on on a lot of other things he's being real steady and, and and cool and he's a politician you know one of the most sickening things about him for me you can quote me is i was seeing a girl that was working for him when i was running for office and i asked the questions and she didn't divulge anything that she couldn't but it was really easy to understand. And I did so much of my own research. He was a secretary of state when he was running for governor of Georgia. What? You can't count the votes for the election for which you're running. So he should have recused himself just in that fact. I don't even need to get into the word gerrymandering, which should be said in Georgia almost every day, or the voter suppression through so many different channels throughout metro atlanta and georgia um we have the second most counties of any state in america Hmm. texas has 258 we have 169 california has 122 new york has 66 (laughs) most states have about 60 counties and we've got like double two and a half wow times more sir why we're not the second biggest state we don't have the second largest population by any means well we had We were the 13th colonized state, the last state to reform slave trading, 
and had all of these local jurisdictions and municipalities that wanted to create their own laws and regulations, and they did successfully. Mm. It was actually the uh, the horse carriage. You wanted to be able to, from your house, ride your horse to the courthouse. That was, as Georgia being such an agricultural-focused mm. state, um, one of the biggest principles to it. And so... It's really, really bad here, and it's not talked about often, which is one of the biggest things that I will focus on with Miss Atlanta Podcast is things that people aren't really talking mm. about need to hear every day. Dude, that's Gerrymandering. Amazing. It's fucked. Look it up. Look about it in Georgia. Go to Ballotpedia and uh, just kind of understand yeah. that locally these municipal elections do way more than presidential or even Senate. And congressional elections. It's true, man. Do you think, uh, to go back to the abortion thing for a second, do you think also, like, you know, they're talking about, you know, overturning Roe v. Wade? Like, I feel like that's kind of like, rather than a principle thing, like, that they actually believe in, it's more of just like a, you know, Headline. we killed Osama bin Laden type thing. Like, we overturned Roe v. Wade. We're the most, con- oh, yeah. we're the most uh, uh, conservative, uh, I'm the most conservative uh, governor there's ever been. You know, I overturned Roe v. Wade. Like, you know, I think that that's kind of something that he's going for rather than actually caring about these unborn babies, you know, that Love they it. claim to actually care about. Facts. You know? People need to hear that. They need yeah. to understand that. But on the flip side of the coin, it is kind of like gross sometimes how much people are like talking about like, like, you know, there's soap. It's like, let's be real. Abortion's not a fun subject and it's not something that, that like is, you know, a fun thing to talk about per se. And also as a dude, it's, it's sometimes hard to even you know feel like your opinion kind of matters in the whole thing at all anyways because it's like which is one of the biggest reasons to make your opinion known yeah yeah as as a dude and that's why i was there um yeah and made signs the night before with some of my friends and it's women's bodies not yeah 90 percent lawmakers who are men's yeah and choices and and the the thing though that it's kind of you know for example, I think it was Lena Dunham. She got a lot of shit for this. One time she said, like, I wish that I've had an abortion so I could stand with those who had had one. It's like, wait a second. You wish you had, like, you know, had a fetus in you that you'd killed? Like, why do you wish that? Like, it's creepy that you wish that you, like, you should be grateful that you haven't had to have one. You know what I mean? Facts. Like, that's kind of gross to, like, I think she meant it a different way, but it was still creepy the way that she was talking about it. Like, let's, let's get real for a second. It's not a fun subject, but... At the end of the day, there's some lines that are like, we've kind of had them for a while and have been pretty, uh, you know, standardized. And, you know, flipping flipping that back kind of feels not cool. But anyways, I, I wanted to, to get back to the part about your style, though, your interesting style. I want to hear about how that how that happened because I want to talk about you running running for office and stuff. But 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 how did that how did your style? You got a unique style. What, what did that come from, bro? Um thrift stores thrift stores uh, i was i grew up in them my mom and, and uncle are super utilitous when it comes to being able to find really great clothing expensive mm-hmm. valuable items and sure they don't really fit that well but what's a 20 dollar tailoring job and i got that in when I was a baby and never really let my mom stop doing it. And I even got to the point where I would buy, I still love finding feels like stuff. digging for gold, man. Absolutely. It's, like, it's like the freaking Macklemore song. Absolutely. Popping and tags. then getting it and then getting it, uh, tailored, but it's, it's like funny the because play. you absolutely. know, you're trying to find some, you know, another man, one man's trash is another man's treasure kind of deal. Absolutely. And so that's why I've always been about, you know, dressing for the position or person that I strive to be. Mm. And that's really one of the reasons I started wearing suspenders and suits every single day uh, a long time ago. And I, and I knew I wanted to run for office back in like 2015 when I started. So you're like, if I want to be taken seriously, I need to be dressing the part. Absolutely. And with that. my business and working in, in law firms, I've always kind of had a reason to wear wear that kind of clothing suits and and suspenders and i got into the suspender thing i I think somewhere around college um 
and it's probably been five, six solid years of wearing them, and it's kind of been my my trademark. People say, David, are are, are you okay? Like you, you were wearing you, you them to the lake. You, you don't have suspenders doing, on you, you, right now. You don't have them on right now, now, which is um, just kind of where I am now. I've worked out three times a day. I'm I'm super comfortable. I, I'm I'm able at this position at my company, my career, to wear gym shorts and you know this X3 kind of gym shirt. And, uh, you know, I was wearing five fingers all day, those Vibram <laughs> shoes that are truly revolutionary. I got a new pair yesterday and um, I've, I'm, I've been the CEO wearing, you know, the full slack suspenders with five fingers. Yeah. And you, uh, that's kind of was with running a small what's, business. Uh, what's the dude's name? Scott Disick. You know, do you know who he is? Like Courtney Kardashian's old, whatever. He used to be the freaking prep master and then he got homies with Kanye and now he's wearing like ripped jeans oh, and like, okay. yeah, you know, yeah, all that yeah. kind of stuff. So it's kind of like the same thing as like, he used to be always like dapper wearing the like suede loafers that with like, in, you know, uh, freaking not engraving, you know what I'm talking about where they, uh, what, what am I thinking of? Uh, they, they have like Emboss? custom designs, not embossing in it's like stitched on the shoes. Gotcha. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I can't, I'm, I can't think of the word, but it, embroidered. There, there we are. One higher. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I was waiting until I could say that. Um, on Chris D'Elia's podcast, he always, uh, whenever his producer does something bad, he always calls him Juan Fire because he wants to fire him. Juan Fire. Like, ah, oh, Juan Fire. And then it, it became his name was Juan Fire. And then when he does something good, he's like, Juan Hire. Juan <laughs> like, Hire. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so anyways. Uh, but, but yeah. So Juan Not Fire. Yeah, Not Fire, Juan Hire. And um, and uh, and his other producer is Ivan. Get, Ivan gets rid of, like Ivan. Ivan gets rid of. Anyway, stupid. <laughs> but um, but uh, yeah, he you know he was wearing the crazy stuff, and then now he's wearing like Yeezys and like ripped denim and hoodies and stuff. So it's kind of it reminds me of that with you. But you still, but sometimes you still pay you still pay homage to the or is it homage or homage? I don't even homage, know. Yeah. yeah, you pay homage to the suspenders. Yeah, and I still wear them. them at the Honestly, lake. I got three pair in my car. <laughs> Um, in this break, I'll probably go throw them on and, uh, you know, just so you can know how the flow usually goes. Oh, I like to bring Gate Gatsby to these days in which we be. <laughs> and yeah, that's kind of my style. I, I like to be the Southern gentleman, the chivalrous human, always walking on the side of the street with, mm. with another person, obviously female. And, um, you know, pull, holding the holding the door open and, l and little things all the time just taking the second to acknowledge people um which is which has been i think the deepest part of my style and, mm. and sure i wear i wear the clothes that make me feel like you know i'm empowered enabled and comfortable yeah to that to do that and you're rocking the fanny pack too it's pretty it's pretty uh functional to be Thank honest you, i'm all about utility yeah, it's Joe. Ro I don't know. A lot of people probably don't know this. Joe Rogan rocks a fanny pack Love constantly, it. a leather fanny pack. Freesh. And he's like, it takes a real man to. He's like, he's like, he said something. He's like, if I was, if I wasn't married, I don't know if I would have the balls to rock it. But like, I don't care, dude. It's functional. Oh yeah, it's so good. <laughs> I mean, not having shit in your pockets is so nice. <laughs> First, and are foremost. you are you are you down with the crossbody fanny pack? Because that's um, kind of the trend right that's now. That's like a. Uh, that's Street nothing nothing really shit. gets in the middle like you know nothing gonna get between you and me right no, here <laughs> like i'm a big i'm a big body movement yeah kind of person yeah. I've, I've read books on body language uh many times throughout my life and any kind of barrier that you create between people is mm, is gonna like be the debilitating body language is weird. yeah absolutely well, what about shirts i guess everyone's wearing a shirt it so. depends i mean you're more exposed so you know um so if with, i was trying every, to be less exposed i should just take my shirt off absolutely <laughs> absolutely with every thought this is one of my favorite quotes my godfather david morris um impressioned it upon me with every action thought feeling you can evolve devolve or stay the same and so that goes with so many different things. And um, what, where were we right before that? Talking about fanny packs on your chest. 
<laughs> Absolutely. So <laughs> that was weird. I was so, saying, don't you take know, off my shirt. That's that's devolving immediately, making a barrier, crossing my arms, putting mm. this cross thing. Sure, it might look stylish, but in the deep down physical the, the interpersonal brain, relationship yeah. skill, you are creating a little barrier. So, and also, I don't like anything kind of touching my heart. I have an acute case of tachycardia arrhythmia. Um, it's genetic. But you think you think something touching your heart, like your phone or something, or um, just anything, a- anything, anything that's not comfortable. And mm. um, you know, I fortunately am healthy and wore a halter monitor to kind of get a diagnostic back in the day. But this Apple Watch has been one of the most beautiful and huh. accountable things of my life. Um, I've always had like an up band, jawbone up band was what I had. Um, I had like thirteen of them. <laughs> Because they were the heart rate monitor kind? It had the heart rate, it had the sleep, it had the steps. And so I'd always want 10,000 steps. And uh, my sleep goals range from six to eight. And um, this has been huge with helping me helping me get 10,000 steps. It seems like the Apple Watch has become a lot more health focused. Oh yeah, I mean it has more. an echocardiogram, which is a specialization my sister just got in echocardiology. Wow. And so literally it can tell you like true deep, information analytics, analytics about, about, your, about your heart, and, your stuff, heart yeah. and where it's been and my resting heart rate is 40. Wow now, bro. Wow. When I'm sleeping is 40. Wow. That's amazing. That's what? really good. That's crazy. Dude it's it's pretty cool like what what do you do with your analytics like that? Like I know some people are so like they're so into the tracking you know like they got an excel spreadsheet of all their shit from their you know Fitbit or whatever. I've never, like, I kind of, I think I kind of. their macros, yeah, their food. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I think, because as a, as a health thing, it makes sense to me. As the utilitarian, like, looking at my texts, I don't know, because Facts. I, um, I, back in the day, you remember the iPod Nanos that were square and touchscreen? They don't make iPod Nanos anymore, really. But there was a company that made watch bands for them. And so it was really the first Apple Watch, mm. in my opinion, because you could, it was literally an iPod on your wrist. I remember that. Yeah. And I had one in high school, and I thought it was so cool. And um, it was cool. I used it to cheat, actually. Oh, disclaimer. Uh, I, would, I would save pictures of my notes on it. Bro, I got away with so much shit with calculators. Dude. And, right? and smartphones, like my Nokia in high school yeah. was helping me shit. you like, dude. The, the, but anyways, the, like in geography, I would literally have a map and like scroll around and like look at the freaking countries on my map and stuff. Like it was nuts. But anyways, I don't That's condone cool. cheating. But um, but, back but to the it, analytics. But yeah, but really, the analytics. um, it's a lot of work counting counting calories. Yeah. Um, and I and I've been four and a half months vegan, vegetarian, uh, plant oh, wow. based. I've still had a little bit of cheese and honey and like you know some processed like. Do granola. you use leather? Products. Um, and I have these boots that I got in Texas on my cross country bike ride that I still wear. They're twelve years old. There's a difference. I've got also, them resold four times, and I love them. They will you, literally never go anywhere. Yeah. So I'm I'm doing the nutrition thing more so as a nutrition. If it thing, came from an animal, yeah. if it had a mama or a daddy, really, we don't need to consume. What about it. eggs? It, all eggs are are the leftovers from. Uh, an ovarian cycle of menstruation for chickens, the eggs that didn't survive. They're never going to be a chicken. Hatch. That's all eggs are when we get down to it. And they've been sold to us in, the, in fucking educational propaganda throughout our entire lives that this is the healthy way to live. And a lot of those scientists and doctors but that do were eat, making that didn't know what eggs? they were saying. Do you eat eggs or not? Not anymore because they really don't need them. And I have a lot of friends that mm. are... Uh, vegetarian, vegan, plant-based, and um, they still eat eggs, and that's cool. Um, really, it's all about enjoying what you do. And I'm on this kick where it's fruits in the morning, veggies at night, a little bit of grains in between, and um, I'm utilizing hummus heavily. I'm utilizing yogurt in the morning, and um, mm. and I still have like pr- some protein shakes. Because in, yogurt in technically isn't vegan, right? Because it's an animal product, right? Um, not if it comes from silk or soy. Oh, there's soy yogurt? Yeah. I didn't even know that. That's oh, pretty yeah. cool. Or Greek yogurt. Um, is Greek, Greek yogurt? Yeah. What's yeah. Greek yogurt derived from? I thought it was milk. A lot of it's milk, but there's also different forms. Interesting. Yeah, because I, I mean, I, I'm honestly just curious because, um, you know, I think some forms of ethical veganism, like if you're just purely doing it for ethical, 
like kind of you know a lot of things it's like i will admire it i'll appreciate it but it's like at the end of the day all your vegetables and stuff the, you're you're participating and actively like you know there, there's definitely animals being like harmed and killed in any sort of farming like it doesn't really matter facts like you know what i mean so it's like i appreciate the 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 uh mindset of it but it's always just funny to me like especially and also with the chicken thing like yeah the, the those chickens that are you know being harvested you know for their eggs they're probably not in ideal situations you you know those chickens are probably being mistreated but if you have a couple of chickens in your backyard and they lay eggs every day like I don't see any not you know those chickens are having right. a great time hanging out back there like I don't see any ethical reason to not eat those eggs you absolutely know what I mean? and and they're eating grass yeah instead of corn which is really the biggest thing that people need to understand is 95 percent of all meat corn is corn fed meat mm. you'll see corn starch high fructose corn sugar Corn, corns and everything. Bro. Corn is literally everywhere and everything. And so, if like you're McDonald's. at least getting plant-based, grass-fed meat, cool, whatever, whatever floats your boat. It was still kind of a transition to me at the beginning. Now I just don't crave it. Yeah, and I've seen, and I first and foremost do it for me to keep as many chemicals out of my body. Mm. My boss Tony Tucci, one of the three owners of X3. Um, that's a cool name. He's been, t- yeah. Tony Tucci. Tony Tucci. Sounds like a rapper name or something. There's yeah, a lot of things. There's the first Tucci. season of Dexter. Little Tony Tucci. Yeah, Tony Tucci. <laughs> uh, one of the one of the villains was Tony Tucci. Really? But so he's this uh, black belt martial artist. Um, he's been off of chemicals and processed food for three years. Wow. And he looks like he's like 30 when he's so he's vegan or does he eat meat or what? Yeah, he doesn't eat anything processed. Um, he's he's vegan. Well, you could eat meat and it's not processed if he killed yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So he's vegan. Gotcha. Um, I'd say I'm ninety percent vegan. 90, okay. Ninety five, since I still have a little bit of the other stuff. Um, gotcha. Like in the cheese. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you, man. I I just can't. But the I, other big I can't ever get hundred percent is the huge, huge carbon problem that we have. Mm. That is one of the biggest things behind myself is the environment. And the impact that processed food, or excuse me, meat, the meat industry is having yeah. across the world. And a lot of places like Asia are just getting warmed up to meat. And so it's really, really rapidly expanding. And it's, uh, what, the 13 years we have in, to make a difference before everything goes to shit? Yeah. It's pretty scary. I feel like, you know, as a one person, it's like, you sometimes just feel like, I don't even know if what I'm doing is making a tiny bit of difference. Because... Really, it's like, you know, like you said, it's the whole fucking meat industry that we're up against or, you know, just cars in general, you know, just like random things like that. It's like, you know, I I do try to do my part. You know, I try to Raising recycle. Awareness, brother, I try you to, have a platform. That's true, medium. man. That's the first and foremost that's true, thing. Man. Having the conversation because we have been bred to not have these combats mm. and to yeah. eat this way and to not challenge it. And my family, my Cajun family members... Look at me like I'm fucking crazy. Yeah. Like, you're not going to eat meat. And that's how I've been personally my whole life. I've said, if you don't eat meat, you can't be as strong as me. You don't have as much protein as me. And you vegans and vegetarians are weak. Literally my mentality for the past 30 years. And now I'm seeing that I can work out three times a day with tons of energy solely off of plants because your body can break down and understand these enzymes and immediately have this energy. You hmm. don't have to take the digestion process, tryptophan out of turkey. How long do you have to sit there and digest on Thanksgiving, right? Mm-hmm. Think about it. If you were to just focus on those veggies and plants, I think back another, to another it real interesting quick. thing that happens when people go vegan too is like they go from a like not very healthy diet, not eating very many plants, eating tons of plants. And then they attribute it a hundred percent that they've cut out all this stuff, and it's like, no, you got. Not only did you cut out all this stuff, but you're also eating hell of veggies and hell of fruits. Whereas before, you like maybe ate a salad every once in a while. Right. So it's like right. that, you know. I so dude, I'm I'm totally on board with the like, you know, as much. I try to stick to like single source ingredients as much as possible. Fact. You know, chicken veggies as much as i can i eat a lot of eggs though i do that's why i was so fresh pushing on the eggs yeah I'm like, man i'm, I'm sorry like, dude so you're telling me, eating, so you're telling me you don't eggs. eat eggs because i eat hella eggs bro I yeah couldn't do it. i used nah, to but, also man and it, like a lot of my friends still do um, yeah 
don't get me wrong. I, I, dude, I The don't whole care. fucking world does. Do what you and, want to and, do. And, and do what makes do you whatever happy. You, yeah, exactly. That's do what, what it comes happy. down to. If you want to hear about what I have to say with nutrition, then we'll talk about it. But yeah. if not, that, that's really how people are. They either do want to talk about it yeah. or they don't. <laughs> the people who don't, I think, also don't want to hear it. You know what I mean? Mm. It's, it's also the same thing with the meat industry. Like, people don't want to think about the meat. Like, they're like... They're like, I don't want to think about the cow dying. I just want to show up and pick it up out of a plastic container and cook it. I don't Absolutely. want to think about it. Like, looking at it raw grosses me out. It's like, well, start thinking about it because you got to face that reality Absolutely. one day. Absolutely. And all that cow is is recycled protein. Plant. Mm -hmm. Plant protein, yeah, which... it's kind of like the circle of life, though. With, with all the other... Uh, and the last real thing I'll talk about the nutrition is our teeth, these beautiful te teeth, these chompers we have, they're not carnivorous. Mm. We only have two little canines. We don't have a mouthful like animals that are made to eat meat. To rip meat and shit. We have these beautiful pearl of whites <laughs> to eat plants. And that was another thing that kind of kicked it to me. Tony had this combo. Why do you with think me. we have the two canines then? Um, like if we're not designed to eat to a little bit. To stabilize or to help break through a lot of, a lot of skins. Um, I mean, we derive from, from. I'm just pushing from back because I because I don't. As you should, th th dude. I, I always push back on. I try to because I I hate listening to podcasts that are one sided. Everybody's agreeing. Yeah, it's it so sucks. fucking boring. Yeah, it sucks. So I, I, I'm, I don't I'm interrupt though, back. but we we can banter a little more. I kind of <laughs> I'm feeling the vibe. Like it's how you know, like Joe, uh, Joe Rogan, Aubrey Marcus. Aubrey Marcus has been my like kind of religion. I'd say the past month and a half, I've listened to maybe eighty of them. Damn. And um, and you're on that two x speed game. On that two x speed, dog. I uh, you r ripping through podcasts ripping. like a monster. But I'll We're, go back through and and I I'm always hitting 15 seconds back <laughs> all the time, all the time. That's I've funny. done it with yours, you know. Yeah. When I'm trying to, and that's something uh, when you drop names. I've mm. realized when names are dropped in podcasts and these big guys are little guys, it's... Uh, you seem to be a name guy. You've dropped a lot of names. Like, you, you know, you're talking about in college, you're like, I stayed with my buddy this, or I worked with this person. What's the what's what's your thing with that? Some people aren't very into names. Well, I respect, appreciate, and love those people. Mm. They were a significant part of my life, helping me get to story. where I am. Yeah. And I have... So many ups and downs throughout my ride, and I'm fortunate to be able to focus on the positive. And that's mm. really something like you were saying earlier with your podcast. You feel like you don't have the stuff to talk about because you're not living it. Um, that's really where I was after the election. Um, I, when was that, by the way? November 4th, 2017. Okay. Um, and I just... So um, like a year and a half ago, basically. Mm -hmm. Nice. That's when the election went down. Math. The campaign. Yeah. Nice. I, <laughs> I do, can do math. I do the math. <laughs> I do it. Um, I had no idea, Andrew, that it would have as much of a mental and emotional toll on me mm. as it did. Um, you know, asking every person that you know for a donation ending in d three digits at the end of a convo is is hard, and you get so many no's. I, sure, I got tons of yeses and. The experience was amazing, getting to meet the people that I did and, and, and learn so much about myself, um, even in that dark time after. Um, did you ever feel like you got to see people's true colors when you asked them for money and stuff like that? <laughs> ding, ding. Um, yeah. They say once you see the way the sausage is made, you don't want to eat it. Mm. And um, that goes with politics in a lot of ways and, you know, fundraising. I've always done fundraising. When I did that bike ride, um, I had to raise $5,000. Mm. And I did it twice. I raised twelve k. And That's um, amazing, bro. So I've always Seriously. been tenacious. That's awesome. Thank you, sir. That's, that's hard to do. 89% of that went directly to organizations in checks that shared our vision. Wow. That's, that's badass. That's awesome. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah, that, uh, that bike ride, there hasn't been an interview for a job or a position um, that I haven't utilized it, brought it up. Yeah, I'm sure. It's a big it's a big accomplishment. It's crazy. It was it was hard. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. I want to talk about that in a second too, but to go back to the um to running for the election cuz we're kind of talking about it right now. You know, what you know, you kind of touched on your main like motivation for running, you know, those big points that you wanted to fix and everything, but um you know, I I kind of can relate to the whole, you know, 
raising money and asking people and stuff kind of like when I was in that company after I dropped out of college because it was the same kind of thing you know you get to see people's true colors once you you know people are it's real easy to get to get you know be friends with people when you're partying and drinking and having a good old time and you know whatever but you know once you start like talking about serious shit and maybe trying to and acting plan chain. for your future or you know uh, something you, you see people just kind of fade away and they're like nah, nah man like what, the, what no like I'm trying to like have fun and like ignore that type of shit like I'm in college I'll, I'll deal with my issues and my life planning and stuff once I graduate bro right. like I'll you know I'll do all this stuff when I graduate like you know I, I'm just I'm doing my thing like nah it's not for me and and I think a lot of people freeze up because they don't want to um, have confrontation too like it's kind of like fight or flight mode when mm. someone starts to ask you for something and you don't really want to do it or you're not sure same thing i'm sure with like you know asking people for money people are not really sure how to respond because you know it seems like life is always pulling you in different directions and so you, you know sometimes it's indirect and sometimes it's very direct and sometimes it's hard to say no but i definitely can relate to the seeing people's true colors because you're like wow i called this person my friend and now they're like openly shitting on this thing that I'm like trying really hard for. Right. Or you hear or about not them even talking. openly. And, yeah. Or you know, behind your back talking shit or, or even just not coming just to my events. Not coming to your like event. That. Yeah. And, and setting expectations, which is, you know, that that's me. Setting that's expectations that's is an big, interesting that's one a big too. Thing. Especially with events because, you know, it's like you, you you have a birthday and a few of your good friends don't show up and you're like, ah, oh, it's fine. You know, they were, you know, they had plans or whatever, you know. But then you have something like that and your good friends don't show up and you're like, what the fuck? Like, you know? Right. And so it's kind of like, you got to think about it like it's your birthday. It's like if, if you're a good friend, if your best friend didn't show up to your party, you'd be probably mad. But like if some of your, like a few of your good friends didn't show, you'd be like, you know, life happens, you know, whatever. But, you know, so you can't take sometimes some of that stuff too personally. Like don't ask those questions. Sometimes it just happens. But oh, yeah. when like no one shows up or like, a bunch of people that you were expecting to show up like and said they were going to show up don't show up then you're like hmm right why'd you say you're going to do that when you didn't do that you know absolutely and that's that's how it goes for a lot of people not following through and so mm. um it, it on the flip side the ones who did show up and did donate even if it wasn't 100 bucks even if it was two dollars mm. you know anything even if they shared one of my posts or this or that that was one of the things i was able to do was utilize the internet make a penny look like a dollar with my campaign people thought it was way bigger than it was huh i also had a campaign consultant who had been on 12 different campaigns and um is super super successful and renowned with it and then i had another campaign consultant come on for free um her name's carrie ann starnes ortiz and uh she was doing her graduate study at uga um, we went to Georgia State together and um, wanted to do it on a small business owner. And with Stay ATL, she contacted me and said, hey, I want to do my, like, all this research and study and record these sessions and go through them. And, you know, my, my college tuition hmm. um, or master's and, on you. And I was so humbled and honored for that and had a lot of really incredible guidance from Carrie Ann. Um, and uh, that that was just a, a monumental thing with the campaign helping me get through it because sure I didn't really have that family support that I that I wanted and, and, and expected a little bit. Um, I definitely lost expectations of, of pretty much everybody and everything somewhere along the line. Hmm. But um, having her and, and my consult, I can't say his name, um, and these other people around me, my family were really, you can whisper it, no, I'm just kidding. I don't care. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I, I don't care. I'm just messing around. But, but in that time, walk me through that. Cause obviously, you know, um, when you're running, you're obviously like hoping that you, you get the nomination or whatever. And then, you know, like you said, the time after was kind of like a dark time. What was that timeline kind of like, and how did you like deal with that? Um, yeah, so I ended up endorsing Lil Liliana Bakhtahari. She's from Gwinnett. Um, she went to Parkview and then Georgia State. Actually, you're older than me. And um, she was running as a queer Muslim. Um, and we were running against this woman named Natalyn Mosby Archibong Esquire, who was so a 16, now 18-year right incumbent. Thank you. Wow. 
Um, and so I ended up endorsing Liliana about two and a half months before the election because I already knew I didn't raise nearly as much money as her. You have financial disclosures and all these things that are public record. And, you know, we just knew. And mm-hmm. so but as far I as- still wanted her. I wanted to do everything I could to, mm-hmm. to help her win. She lost by 280 votes Damn. out of like 16,000. Um, and uh, yeah, Atlanta, Atlanta elected a lot of great council members, but also still has a lot of corruption. And uh, we're still reeling from Adam Smith, our former uh, director of all the financial trades of, of the city, um, over $1 trillion in contracts. Wow. Yeah. He was, um, he's in prison Whoa. right now. He's so in prison right now? prison. Wow. How, this is crazy because I don't even know that name. I don't even know that story. I'm sure it's a big story, but like, what happened? He, he was, worked under the Kasim Reed administration and before that, Shirley Franklin and, um, he basically oversaw all the contracts throughout the city for construction, uh, the snowpocalypse, the disaster with that, when we were renting snowmobiles and special equipment for 800 uh, or 5,000% more than they were supposed to be. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I just, I heard that too many times. And so, so with the corruption, was that just him doing deals where he's like, hey, was that like, like for example, in the example of the snowpocalypse where we were renting equipment for way more than it should have been, was that from private company or is, it, or is that from like other cities or where did that equipment come from? So we got some from other cities to help save us, but it was private companies around mm. that we ended up paying these huge, ridiculous, like 9,000% on some stuff. Um, the director of procurement, Adam Smith. It's you like, can look him up. He's in yeah. federal prison right now. He's been a very, very cooperating witness for other indictments. And huh. a lot of people are continuing to be indicted. Mickey Bickers um, still hasn't been indicted. Mickey Bickers. So, so under the table, maybe he was uh, like saying, hey, to these private companies, hey, uh, I'll, you know, I'll get government funding to pay you. And then under the table, they were paying him some of it back or like what was Yeah, the... yeah, he was getting kickbacks. Gotcha. A lot of people... That goes with the airport. Mm-hmm. I I've mean, heard it, corruption like some, has been yeah. bred through Atlanta 40, 50, 60 years. Mm. And, um, you know, it goes there back was to, a thing with like the Pentagon where they were like, there was things with like $100,000 hammers or something they were paying yeah, for. Yes. Something crazy like that. I, I could be wrong, but a it was something thing, along people those. People talking about, which yeah. is something that goes, you know, far spread and the reason that I'll, I'll spend the time to talk about it is because it's locally it's here in mm-hmm. our city in our greater area um but i think keisha lance bottoms is doing a great job as mayor um, great name too yeah. lance bottoms yeah bottoms the bottoms bottoms bus. up <laughs> yeah, yeah she she's she's a cool chick um i met her That's awesome. early on um i met her husband actually first Derek bottoms he's with home depot and um, I still laugh. I'm so fucking five years old. Bottoms, <laughs> right? <laughs> Derek Bottoms, the, the Bottoms bus. She literally had a bus, and it was called the Bottoms, the bottoms bus. bus. That's amazing. Um, yeah, she was like uh, one of the last in the polls to win, but had Kasim Reed support, and and ended up winning, beating Mary Mary Norwood, um, nice by slim margin, and um. I think I think it's been she's been doing some really incredible things. I'm extremely impressed. There's been way more transparency um, in this administration and what's going on. <coughs> what was the time after you, you yeah, know, after but, you realized but, you didn't get elected? What was that like for you? Or, or realizing that you didn't raise enough funds or whatever it may be. What was that? What was that kind of um, like? Because obviously it was a big dream. Yeah, man. I just uh, I got scared. I got complacent. I got lazy. I um really wasn't doing what I what I could or what I thought I could and uh went into this funk D- didn't didn't have a job for a little while because I put all my time into the to the okay, election yeah. my my money my uh 
my capacity, you know, into into this campaign. And I didn't I didn't understand what it would do. So, you know, I got another job, but I still wasn't that happy. But the biggest thing is I, ha I hadn't gotten back in tune with my body. I wasn't working out. I wasn't eating well. And that's really where it starts. Mm. Anybody who's not happy, you're only one good, one workout away from a good mood. And that can be the smallest of things. And so I saw a Gary Vee video that inspired me to um, record myself for 60 seconds saying every every deep dark truth that that i'm ashamed of and i did that wow. with the intention of posting it and um i ended up posting uh what were several the, live videos about, what were some of the things i mean if you don't if, i mean if you don't want to divulge it whatever but you said yeah you man it, so. absolutely so about not not reaching these expectations that i had set um with with the election with raising the money with uh especially because it's public you know you're doing yeah, so much public publicly. facing stuff and then having to like admit defeat kind of you know like in the face of everyone in the face of adversity you didn't make it happen or whatever right. i kind of felt that a little bit with when i uh left that company that i was like preaching for two years and you know all my friends and family knew about it and all this stuff to then kind of quote unquote admit defeat of like leaving that company and all that it's, it's, it's kind of hard to like publicly, for example, I've, I've, you know, like I said, the past few months I was, you know, kind of discouraged about the podcast and I was, you know, thinking about what would it be like if I just like quit it or whatever, like what would it have, you know, it's almost, it's also kind of like that, it, but I wasn't ever going to do it. I wasn't gonna let myself do that. Cause I'm still like got such a long game mentality. I just needed to get out of this mini funk that I was in a little bit, but you know, it, it's, um, it's like one of those things where, you know, when you're standing on a tall building and you think, what if I jumped off right now? You don't actually want to do it, but the you go through all the, you go through the storyline. Right. Like, that'd be crazy. Dude, what do my friends and family think? Who would show up to my funeral? You know, you like go Absolutely. through all those motions. And I think it's like kind of healthy to explore those. Like if you try to suppress that kind of stuff, you're oh, like yeah. not being a real human. Which is kind of what I was doing. And on top of all that, my, uh, I lost two really close people. Mm. Within about four months of each other, my uh, youth leader, Ron Walker, the guy who took us to Italy on the pilgrimage, and a guy who was a big role model in my whole life committed suicide. Um, Whoa. And then... That's rough, man. Four months later, one of my best friends, fraternity brothers, roommates, sh camp, Edward Campbell Schwears III, um, overdosed fentanyl. First time, damn. Second time trying heroin, he had done it just one other time, and uh, you know it can it can happen just that quick. And so that was all like right before November of seventeen, and it just hit me, man. I got real fucking sad about it, and I did a lot of soul searching. I went into airplane mode for like three months mm. on my phone, literally. Damn. I was hardly ever turning it on to check anything. Damn, yeah, hard man. unplug. That's cr that's kind of nuts these days. Yeah, yeah. Was it like GPS? You're like, shit, I don't know where I'm going. I got to turn this bitch on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That'd be was... me, bro. I couldn't do it. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, Mr. Atlanta, you know your way around with your yeah, eyes Yeah, I definitely closed, can get around son. for sure, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just wanted to disconnect. I needed to because I've always been so connected. Mm -hmm. And um, that helped me get to where I am now and help me understand those traumas mm. and embrace those and then come to terms with those and, and love those yeah. and appreciate it. It's appreciate awesome that it you've like dealt with that, you know, cause a lot of people don't and they, it bubbles up in all kinds of weird ways. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, On that I, note, little break time. Sure, dude, I got to pee too. Let's pause for a sec. Cool. All right, where were we? We're back. Um, that was a nice pee break. I don't always take pee breaks, but when I do, they're amazing. They gotta be good and long. <laughs> that was, uh, I think I peed for 50 seconds. Wow. I wasn't counting, but it was a while. <laughs> <laughs> a minute. I drink um, a lot of water, dude. It's yes. been one of the biggest changes. I'm, I mean, I've, I've drank water a lot throughout my life. <laughs> yeah, I'm drinking a lot of water throughout my life. Uh, I mean, it's such a common thing, right? Drink water. But pounding 32 ounces the first 30 minutes that I'm awake, mm. um, I've I'm recently bad with on the, what is, the Marcus what is, Arbor, Aubrey thing with putting uh, Himalayan pink sea salt 
like in your water with lemon with lemon mm, i did that for a minute do you do the whole lemon or do you just squeeze it um i did it for a minute i think i squeezed it and then i threw my and lemon in threw there. it in yeah i don't remember I've i did it for a both. while it's mainly I'll... so that your body retains like the like electrolytes or something i can't remember the positive right. benefits yeah, that's it's what so it is. So you don't flush out everything when you when you like drink in tons of water. It helps you like retain a lot more stuff. Exactly, yeah. like drinking seawater. You know, it's. I forgot about that. I I did that for a fat minute, and then I think I like went on a big trip, and fat then like. Minute. <laughs> I like that one. I'm all, I always say a minute. It's been a minute. I mean, I'm very Atlanta, Mister Atlanta. It's been a minute. It's been a hot minute. Where you stay at? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's been a fat. But minute. a fat minute. That's a new one. That's I like a good that. one. I like yeah, it's that been a lot. Fat minute, but um. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> so that water, that water in the morning. How is much is so, thirty-two ounces? I'm so bad with so, measurements. So, um, do you think this or an algae? How much? Yeah, is an these. Algae? This is, I think, thirty-two ounces. This might be twenty-eight. But yeah, the Nalgene is going to be thirty-two. Um, and I, I carry two Nalgenes with me at all times, water bays, as they are. Um, I keep one in the freezer, getting cold, and then the other one on me. So you're always with the crisp. You never Literally. room temperature. Oh, I like being, I man, I like my water cold. Ooh. My body runs hot, and uh, it's just how I go. Like, feel, <laughs> feel the back of my neck now. I don't think it's that bad. This is the first neck feel on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> is it hot? It's warm, bro. It's pretty, like, that's pretty just warm. how I, I am. I'm pretty hot, too, typically. I don't but get you know sick. What, you know what's interesting, though, is I've been doing a lot of sauna. And I've oh, been I able to, get into it I've been heavily. To, I've been able to tolerate a lot more hot. Like, I, I do, like, hot yoga. And it's helped me tremendously. You doing cryotherapy? Yoga. I've done it once. I mean, that's the thing. The hard thing with cryo is like it's pretty expensive, and it's like it, it, it's one of those things where it's hard to measure the benefits in real time. We'll find a cryo place to sponsor us. I've already got one place with my X3 connections. <clears throat> nice. That uh, wants to, I think, give me one free one. Dope. Um, yeah, I, so, I do. You know, I, uh, try to find that. Try to find a place that'll girl, do for discounts, and we can yeah. have them be sponsors of the podcast. Yeah, this girl that I um, know, her name's on Instagram is Liz Ashley. She um, started a page. I think it's called Fit ATL or something like that. Yeah, I know and Liz. they, yeah, yeah, yeah. and sh- they did an event with an, a cryotherapy place. So I went to. I got it for free. So nice, cool. Dude. Or maybe it was like half off or something all right well we'll, we'll keep each cheap. other yeah. i'm not abreast. gonna mention any names though because you ain't getting any no free promotion on this pod not today um, I'm not kidding. yet <laughs> yeah exactly but um but yeah with don't cryotherapy don't i i don't uh it, it's it, you know it's one of those things where at, at the gym I, there's a sauna in the gym so it's easy i can you know i'm already doing it i, I can easily just incorporate it but with with the cryo it's like i gotta go someplace i gotta plan it out you ever done flotation tanks like the like sensory deprivation tanks, ooh, bro, you gotta go. There's um a really good place. I, I uh, Matt Thomas actually uh, uh, recommended them to me, and they actually gave me a complimentary um, uh, float. It's called the Atlanta Wellness Center, I think, something like mm, that. Yep. I feel really bad if I mess up the name because they gave me a free float, but um, I will promote them because they they gave they they hooked it up fat. But um, <laughs> well, uh, yeah, yeah. Like, but but um, but they they were awesome. The other place that I've been to is a place in Little Five, and it um, it's nice, but like it's a little more hippie, a little more dirty. This place is a little more feels like a spa, feels a little more clinical, feels n- nicer. I I, I definitely want to go back to them, mm. but it's pretty interesting the float tank thing because um, it's very like I know you're kind of like into the whole meditation breathing all that kind of stuff you, oh yeah. you would love it you would lo- absolutely love it because it basically gets you into this place where it's totally sensory deprivation um the body the the water that you're floating in is the same pre- temperature as your body temperature and it's completely dark you're wearing ear pl- earplugs and it's completely silent so like you basically feel like you're just floating in in space like you you're floating in nothingness for like an hour and 90 minutes love it and it's um it's pretty crazy because you start to uh, what you say uh, oxygen mask. No, or? you you're uh, you're just breathing in the air. You're in this little pod, and um, they have fresh air getting like circulated in it, so you're not gonna like suffocate and die in it or anything. But um, it's completely dark, so you can't see anything. Like literally, whether your eyes are open or closed, you can't tell the difference. After a while, you don't even know whether you're laying upside down or you're Love laying it. on your stomach. Like it's cool. crazy. There's like a thousand pounds of Epsom salt in the in the mm-hmm. tank, so you're f- literally floating effortlessly. Like you don't have to try or anything. 
and um, it's pretty nuts. You get into some weird like head spaces in there. All some right. people have experienced, you know, some freak out, some panic attacks in there. But as long as you <clears> go <throat> in with good intention and like you're willing to kind of explore that monkey mind, that that un un uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like the there's nothing to. Uh, stimulate your mind like it's literally just blackness and nothingness and your mind is just running full gear freaking out because there's nothing stimulating it it's kind of cool hmm. it's and it's and it's uh fun it's like a challenge to kind of like calm your brain down and stop thinking about your to-do list and absolutely it's kind of like yoga you know i don't know if you're into yoga that much but it, it's uh it's it's very uh positive for me but anyways uh there was a point to that, and I don't remember. But but, but anyways, the, the cryotherapy thing you were asking me about, that's what it was. Have you, have you done cryotherapy very much? Like no. Nah. Oh, okay. Well, either way. I mean, I've done cold baths. Um, yeah. When I did the bike ride, both the first and second time, we had places <clears throat> that would just either have some kind of little cryo thing or, yeah, like, so bath. I guess, yeah, or just the ice bath. We were, because we were going to a lot of colleges, like... Uh, Literally, I did the southern route of America and then the northern route. The next year? In 2010. Wow. Let's talk about that because that was another big point that I wanted to talk about was this bike ride. So you were in college. It was a philanthropic thing, right? How many guys were riding with you? We had three teams of 35. And they were all um, from your fraternity or was it all kinds of Greek life or what was it? Only pie cap. Different schools, all different across chapters the nation. Cool. across the nation. Nice. So it was like 90 people. You said three teams of 30? 35, yeah. Damn. I'm so good at math. <laughs> got it, boy. You got it. <laughs> but um, so so like you said, you, you, it was you 28 went... cyclists, seven crew members. They had vans. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, we how did you flew fl- out to San Francisco. How did you raise the money, by the way? Were you just saying, hey, the we're hustle, doing this? Hustle, bro. Just hit, like, I mean, that was uh, in the early days of, of utilizing email heavily, so I did that. I wrote a lot of letters um, both times. Um, the second time, I was able to get a lot more corporate donations, and I got donation matching. Walmart gave a thousand. Um, so Walmart gave twice a thousand, and I was able nice. to, uh, to get a lot of things raised. I got my flight uh, paid for. I got. My bike for like seven hundred eighty dollars or two thousand dollars specialized delay elite named Maria. Um, you know, it was it was amazing, and so we rode on average eighty five miles a day, stopping and we didn't go straight across, right? Like we went through San Fran, which is, as Mark Twain said, the coldest summer or winter I've ever spent is a summer in San Francisco. Because it's like it's literally like arctically cold all all gear at certain parts of the day, because of the air and coming off the water. Really? And and I'm just about to go to San Fran in a couple at. of weeks. Yeah, What's I know you're gonna link pack? up. Um, I was actually mentioning this in Instagram in the comments on Umama's pick. Go ahead and link you up with our friend Noreen, who I lived in Spain with, and she and I did an excursion to. Africa and she's just one of those girls who's with the shit. She knows the ins and outs and she's been over there working for a while and is in the medical field and definitely somebody nice. You know, you, that, you probably with. have a ton of mutual friends and um cuz she grew up in Gwinnett. She went to Parkview. Nice. I think, yeah. That's awesome. And so um yeah, the the bike ride. So you flew out to San Fran and you said you took the southern route. So what states did you hit? So we went through Nevada, not to be confused with Nova- Nevada. It's Nevada. With <laughs> Nevada. That, that Nevada. Kind of, yeah, right? That's what they want to hear. But when I so did wait, it. So the locals say Nevada? Is that what it yeah, is? Yes, so that's te- technically. It sounds it like a Michigan accent when you say it like that. Like know, Nevada. Right? right. Nevada. 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 That's weird. Nevada. Um, worst state in America. But I feel like. 85% if, of its owned by the government. Literally. Worst state. It, yeah, and it was just cycling through a whole bunch of bullshit. And I've nothing. only been to Las Vegas. And so. so once we got to Vegas, that was dope as fuck. Like, you know, <laughs> we spent two, day, two and a half days out there, got to meet the community in Vegas, the people that don't just go to there to party, the people that live there. That was, that I, was truly I know some people that live in Vegas. And, it's cool. 
And the people that live in Vegas are dope. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Reminds me of Arizona, you know, like kind of, kind of like the suburbs of Vegas. Like, yeah, kind of reminds me of like Scottsdale or something. Yeah. Yeah, I heard that on your podcast. Um, and so Arizona was an amazing, that was our next from uh, Nevada. We were in Bullhead City, which was incredible. We did 120 miles. Damn. In 120 degree weather. That Damn. Was the, that was pretty much the hardest day at that point. Oh, uh, no. Uh, the, uh, um, town, not, what's the mountain called? It'll come to me. Kirkwood Mountain around Lake the whole, Tahoe. The whole uphill the whole day, pretty much, or what? That Yeah. Uh, it was 14,000 feet in elevation in one day. Did you I go did. up that willingly, or I did, did you have twice. to do it? Yeah, I actually set the record the second time for the extended route. The record for fastest time up it? Uh, to complete the, it was downhill at the end, <laughs> which was fast as fuck. I went like eighty-two miles per hour. No on, way on a bike. On something the width of a dime. <laughs> Holy shit, bro! <laughs> Bruh. It was ex- it, that bike ride. I mean, it changed. And we your were life. in a pace line. You it know, changed so your we life. Were, it changed my life. And it was this. It was the best pie caps from each chapter across the country. So all these, and I went by myself. Like that's so what no I did. Your I moved to Atlanta by myself. I went on this bike ride at 19 by myself. Like I went and lived in Spain for 10 months at what 22 by myself. 10 like, months. That's no joke. Mm-hmm. Where'd you live in Spain again? In Granada. Oh yeah, you told me that. That's one of my favorite cities, dude. I, that's like I wish I spent more time there. I only spent like two days there. It's an amazing city. Um, there's like seven universities there. Yeah, it's um, sick. We were, you know, right across from the Alhambra. Yeah, at dude. The Centro de Linguas Mardano. I drank some good sangria right there. Yeah, yeah sangria, man. <laughs> I remember those roads. We had a we had a um, rental car and we had an Airbnb like right at the top of the hill across from the Alhambra, and um, I was driving, dude, because I was the only one in my family who can drive stick. So I'm like driving up these treacherous fucking roads, Some and they're skinny stuff. as fuck. Whew. And all the all the walls on the sides are like cracked from cars hitting it. And other cars are zoom. No, the locals don't give a fuck. Fuck's given whatsoever. Mm-mm. Yeah, I'd say after six weeks living out there, not even. I'd say ten days. I was like, mira. <laughs> like at, at first I was like, perdón, perdón, is perdóneme, lo siento, le perdón. Mira. Like when I was, and I'm just like. Watch out! Like yeah. when I would be walking down. Mira, he's like, look, right? Like, what? Mira, yeah. yeah. What? Mira, that's funny. <laughs> vale, vale. <laughs> that's Basta. like everything. Yeah, in 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 uh, Italian, they because uh, I was an au pair in Italy. The kids would always say pasta. It's like stop, pasta, mm-hmm. pasta, yeah. like all the time. Because you know, little kids are like, stop, right. stop. Stop, you're annoying me. Basta. Basta. There's always basta, everything. It's funny how each culture has their own little yeah. slang. Um, yeah. I got away with vale. Yeah. And I, vale. I would say it like vale. Yeah. vale. I picked up the fucking yeah, vale. lisp when I was out there. Vale's like all good, right? Nah, vale. It's literally yes, no, okay, yeah, vale. maybe, yeah, tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> why not, good, bad, ugly, vale. beautiful. It's, every, it's everything. You, it's all about how you say it. Yeah. Which yeah. is what the immersion makes you understand quickly. When you're out there, if you don't learn how to talk with your hands and your intuition, your your intentions. If you don't set that intention of how you want to mm-hmm. communicate what you're communicating, you won't. Mm. And uh, that's uh, that's the only other time I actually grew my hair out when I was living in Spain. Mm. Um, so now you're feeling the Spain vibes with the flow. A, a little, but being a third world country is really not like a second world country out there. I mean, in Granada in specifically. Spain. I mean, Madrid's there's pretty a cra- lot of really rich people everywhere. Madrid's in, pretty in crazy. And, and a lot of places in Spain, but there's a lot of poverty. Their motto is manana. They've had the second worst economy behind Greece for the past 15 years. And I literally hated the siesta in the middle of the day. <laughs> Two and a half hours, three and a half hours that I couldn't, you know, go to, go the, to store. the store, go to the post office, go to the Bruh. phone, get minutes, like do anything and uh, I'm I'm a proactive person. I'm not gonna just sit around. And that's you yeah. know, manana. They'll do it. Yeah. And and since it was so expensive to take a it's shower, a out there, like our madre would be like David, David, banging on the door. And really, you know, if our showers were taking too long, so literally, did you have a host family or what was one the deal? madre who was divorced with a cat and heat? 
So that also <laughs> kind of made my experience like not as great as other people's out there. Because I have a lot of friends. I had a girlfriend that lived there three times. That's sick. Dude, the freaking thing about the, the lady who's divorced with the cat in heat, that sounded like a movie. And it was in heat, too, dog. <laughs> And bro, like, and we didn't. We were the only house without Wi-Fi. Her her son ended up hacking our neighbor's Wi-Fi. He ended up how to go through and, and hacks the hack, hack the hex codes and <laughs> no get way. their IP. Yeah, it was amazing. Like, I, I you can't really do that in America. Like, I mean, some, I guess you can, but like, yeah, whew. dude, that's funny, man. <laughs> that's hilarious. So you lived in Granada for ten months. That's sick. What'd you do for work? Well, I was in Granada for about five and a half, but I went to Madrid early. Nice. And then I stayed later. What part of Madrid did you stay in? Um, all over couch serving. Oh, couch serving. And yeah. and hostels. Nice, nice. Yeah, I, I was no pair in Madrid for a little while. We were in like kind of the suburbs though, Alcobendas. Alcobendas. Love it. Yeah. yeah. It was like right next to the airport, pretty much. So that was sick because like on the weekends I would just like. Peace out. Go to like go to some other place for like a couple days and then come back. I love it. But um, but yeah, my host family in Spain is the shit. We still keep in contact to this day like Good. all the time. Uh, I went and visited them last summer at the beach. We're gonna go visit them again this summer. I'm pretty sure at the beach again. So oh, I love it. Yeah, they're they're super cool. Yeah, I had a big like I always loved Spanish and studied it, and that helped reinforce. Yeah, I'm gonna speak Spanish forever. Yo puedo nice. hablar en español con todos. Si quieres hablar conmigo, vamos. Do Mexicans here get mad at you for speaking like Spain Spanish? No. No. Excuse me. <laughs> there was an emphasis on the no. No person who's Hispanic will ever feel negatively about you trying their language. Mm, or that's true. Here or abroad. That's true. As long that's as you true. give a fuck and try. That's true because also in America, like if you're working at a restaurant or something like this, for example, my dad has an ice cream business, so I'd work there sometimes. And like the, the like, you know, I, I spoke a little bit of Spanish from high school and stuff, and there'd be some like Mexican guys that would come and order, but they'd always do it in Spanish. And um, one of the guys I work with was like, dude, I just get mad when they don't even try, man. Because it's like, they know some of the words, but like they don't even give. They're not even trying to speak English, and it like, and I'm like, yeah, you're right. Like, and, and since I understood them, it didn't really matter that much to me. But it's like, to, I, I understand on one hand because like these guys are old, they don't give a fuck. But on the other on the other side, it's like, dude, you're like in America, like at least try, like at least you know, it's try all on to circumstance, a little you, bit, know? you know, like if it's the owner of the restaurant who doesn't need to have those conversations, yeah. He might just not be speaking or trying on purpose. But yeah. I understand what you say in the hospitality industry. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've been in Ubers with, in, in yeah. America, like I was with my family in Miami. Miami, dude, I was about to say that. With my Mimo, who's from 90, Louisiana. From Louisiana. Oh my Maton God. Rouge, who's, <laughs> who's 96 now. She's probably was 94. Two then, and uh, you're in Miami. This young, probably 16, 17 year old Uber driver who's not Alberto in the picture. He's definitely want Alberto's nephew and driving his Uber. He, driving his Uber and uh, spoke no English. Fortunately, I was a little tipsy. In the front, because my family recognized when we were getting in, like, this is not the guy in the picture. And dude, this is like my Uncle Mark, who his husband invented LASIK eye surgery. So they're literally shy of billionaires. Like, he's on the hook. This was a suburban, right? And he ordered the Uber. Uncle Mark did. Mm. And so this was like the first year of Uber. And he was like, you know. Not happy with it. The guy got like I'm sure he made, made, he a, made a comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he gone. But it was uh, it was just funny, and so I was speaking Spanish up there because he did not speak he a lick he, of English. Yeah, he couldn't really navigate us to where we were going. Mm. Um, we got lost, and I had to like get us out. And, and you know, so it uh, it just depends. My favorite place to travel right now in the world is. Colombia, specifically 
Medellin. <laughs> I like the way you said both of those things. Colombia, Medellin. 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 Nice. I've never been, I've never really been in South America at all. And um, I need to change that. Costa Rica, Mexico, Central, anywhere? I've been to Mexico, but that's still kind of like north, right? Depends on where in Mexico. Yeah. I've only been to like, I've been to Mexico City recently, which is cool, in like February. Um, So that was like real Mexico. But all the other places have been like Cabo and uh, uh, Cancun. Right, yeah. Wait, is Cancun, is that it? Is that Mexico? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, sir. Cancun on a cruise. And then Cabo San Lucas with my with my family, uh, we stayed in a awesome. That was a really cool vacation. We stayed right on the water. It was sick, dude. It's so awesome. I loved. I, I really like Cabo a lot. And we and like outside of the hotel, we went uh, to like these dope taco stands and stuff. We got the best tacos ever. Oh my gosh, so good that and cheap as fuck too, Absolutely. dude. Mexico City. Is awesome as far as food, bro. So I've, I've heard cheap. that <clears throat> some of my best friends, John and Alan Barr, they're identical twins who live in Greenwich Village, New York, the West Village. Nice. Where Friends is based out of around all these bars and like yeah, they gave me couch surfing voucher vouchers like early on. They like helped put me on the map with that. Like they have extremely successful blogs and uh, nice. YouTube's podcasts now. And um, one of their girlfriends, fiance now, is from Mexico, and they've been going down there and vlogging it, and just like, whoa, I need to hit it for sure. I have fortunately done some traveling around Central America. Um, I went to Costa Rica and Panama with my buddy Andrew Nunez and Brian Acapala. Andrew is a Colombian, American Colombian, and Brian is American Nigerian prince. Literally. What? I didn't even know he was a prince until after the That trip. sounds like an email that I'm getting. Right, I'm a Nigerian I know, right? prince <laughs> and I need money or something. So some imagine shit. that that trio, you got the white boy who can speak the Spanish pretty good, not like the Colombian, and a lot better than the bulky, dark skin Nigerian Brian Acapala and prince that, you know, that looked like the muscle. And so it was like the translator of the money, the muscle that we looked. And so we <laughs> we went to Costa Rica, had an amazing time, but decided to go to Panama. And um, I'll talk about Costa Rica. We went, we drove west and flew in, got a, rented a car, got a fucking hotspot. I light up when I say it because it literally helped make the trip. Without the navigation, the communication, the posting, all that shit. It, I mean, the translation. It was, it was so clutch. And um, so we drove west, stayed in Haco, and then like Putacana, and, and went more south to um, Manuel Torres, and went to the park, and or Manuel Antonio, and and we're like, you know what? We're right by Panama. Why not like hit another country, get some more stamps on our passport? And so. It's always the thing, man. It's like, should we go? Eh, it's another stamp on the passport. Let's do it. Let's do it. We didn't get our passport stamped when they let us in. Oh, that sucks. We didn't know that they didn't stamp us. They checked our car. They searched us. You we didn't realize it until you were thumbing through later, and you're like, what, what the fuck? No, we didn't realize it until we were leaving two days later. Oh. And, and they're like, how'd you get and here? And they detain us. Fuck, dude. For 36 hours. You think they didn't stamp it on purpose to fuck you guys? Absolutely, to make us pay these corruption taxes to get out of fuck Panama. Fuck that, dude. That pisses me off. Yeah, it was fucked. Did you get it stamped on the way out at least? Yeah, yeah, and we got you like... paid for it. We got other stamps, papers, like that. We had, we had a piece of paper, we had a staple in there. Um... Dude, that's so annoying, And like, bro. thank God that we tracked where we were coming from and this and that because like they didn't... They didn't want to believe us. Travel by and, car. And, the thi- and the thing was, yeah. you were traveling by car, right? Yeah, yeah. Fuck. And a rental car, which we weren't even supposed to technically take across country borders. Oh. We didn't know that. And so yeah. we had to pay uh, $1,400 a piece to get out. Um, when it was all said and done, I was having to get like cash advancements on on certain credit cards because like I couldn't withdraw from my debit and and it was just and they were like driving us around the first night like they let us stay in a hotel um that was like of their choosing and we're like watching us and you know we had a little weed in the car and we had all kind of been drinking Andrew was pretty much sober when we got almost Are out drug of the charges country. pretty crazy there 
Yeah, I mean, you get arrested for something like that, you're done. Mm. So, like, we didn't want to buck the horn too much, but we also knew that they were doing this on purpose. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> Andrew could understand them fully. I can understand them somewhat. And um, so he... That's good I, if, had if a it, full... If it, 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 was, it was good and bad because it was, it was good that he knew, but it was bad because he was pissed. And he actually was saying that. Like, he was challenging them and saying, fuck y'all, you can't do this. Like, and I was on the phone with the embassy a lot. I had hella charges on AT&T that I had to get reimbursed. Because I was like, y'all better make sure we don't die. Because that's what it felt like the whole time. I mean, you were on the, the government phone was going to kill us, the U.S. embassy in Panama. Wow. Yeah. And so the next day... Um, that is pretty amazing that, like... They, they didn't find the little weed that we had and weren't really worried. We were, but um, after the first day, we weren't. They <clears throat> take us to get this money and, and I'm on the phone with the embassy. We didn't want to pay it. And it was just like all these hoops. Like, we almost get out again. They take us back. Do you think and, it's just uh, a scam to get money or do you think they're also trying to make they, an example of you? They had done this to uh, like f- 15 other people just in front of us at this last checkpoint border like it's a very common thing that happens in that country of panama and in the northern wow. tips i see but, but so these guys anybody. that were like not stamping your passport is it all just a giant scheme like you know like are they just not stamping anyone's passport and they just know that <clears> they're not going to do that probably what's they, in it for the guy not stamping is he getting a kickback you know what i mean like it, is it, it all depends the same guys? it depends it could be real specific like that in some of the of the borders of the entry points absolutely and it could also just be hey because we'll let these f- three drunk americans stumble in and you know try to get back out later we drove all the way around the entire country though to get to boco de toros took a ferry out to this area like these beautiful islands like and I had this kind of like incredible majestic time but then um you know when we were leaving the weed we got was from there. It was some shitty, like, swag <laughs> with fucking <laughs> seeds. Uh, the, sh- the weed that we actually still had um, from Costa Rica was dope. It was pretty good. Costa Rica's pretty developed. Like, they have, it's not, people aren't really scared to go down there, like Colombia or other places. Um, but so we end up getting detained into the local jail um we didn't how many days we were you detained um for like we had shackles around our ankles for i didn't have them as long as everybody else because i got to go out and get food fortunately they let us do that and we were in the lobby area but for like i guess six hours and then we were we were detained for 36 hours total wow um it, it felt like a a month it could, i mean it could have been. We had, they had to take us to the hospital to get cleared like two or three times. I mean. To get cleared it, for what? Ready to, like, to leave. It was this whole racket and Andrew knew, but I was able to kind of keep them tranquil because they, they were going to keep us longer, you know. It would have been bad. Um, Fuck. But so I definitely don't recommend going to that country. I mean, sure, some people listening are, are Panamanian or have friends and family who are from Panama, and it's a whole different experience and, and parts of the country and this and that. Um, but back to really where I, I'd suggest you take your sixth trip this year is Medellin. It's the eternal spring. Mm. Everything you ever heard about it, between the food, the booze, the women, all the, the Colombian the, people I've ever met the, have been super cool. The 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 culture, the people, the climate. It's literally the Los Angeles of South America. Really? It's always perfect. That's why they call it the Eternal Springs. Literally perfect weather, 78 degrees. Is it on the off. coast? Uh-uh. It's, it's a central? Yeah. Huh. But it's still like yeah. the weather is amazing. Yeah, it's the, the, the way it's looking. That's why Pablo Escobar, you know, like one of the reasons that so many people, the Medellin cartel – have have been there and had these turf wars because they want that turf like they mm. want to live there like that climate is the best climate yeah and some of those people are so amazing and they really embrace americans um korea really i've spent some time i lived in really? korea for north or south <laughs> yeah right people are dumb as hell when they ask that shit it's so funny when people like like someone introduces themselves like oh i'm korean oh north or south it's like jesus christ like <laughs> right <laughs> You don't get out of there. Right. <laughs> Anyways, um, but but uh, you went to South Korea. What did you say? So, a little bit of time in Seoul, Iksan, 
is where hmm. Rebecca was living. And so cool. I stayed there for three weeks and we went I did a podcast with there. my friend. Uh, it's one of my original podcasts. I think it was like in the first 15 or so. My friend Trey Reed, he lived in Korea for like two years or something. And uh, he talked all about that trip, so it's pretty. It cool. changed my perspective on the world. True, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it did. Are we doing a little Instagram story? What up, world? <laughs> um, that's that's cool. How long did you live in Korea for? Three weeks. So S- it, still it three was weeks. A trip. Also, it was long enough. Like you know, they have hot water running underneath the floor. I was there when it was like a snowstorm. Whoa. For half the time. And so, so yeah, the hot water heats the floor? Like the the efficiency and utility of this country is so far surpassed most of America. Um, it's it's beautiful and amazing. So yeah, hot water runs underneath the floor because it's the most economical way to heat as heat as hot heat rises and yeah. so we were sleeping on the floor and and that was, that was oh that's cool. awesome and the food was so cheap back to Colombia, everything is true that you've ever heard except the drugs and the crime crime is pretty much dissipated it's it's pretty fucking safe there huh. everywhere now and drugs are so illegal um if you get caught with pot it's a year really? korea too i think it's like two years i was gonna say those yeah a really lot of strict. asian con- my my friends are from um, well, prostitution's legal you can go yeah. pay twenty dollars on a credit card to have sex with a woman or a man for which, for which it seems backwards to us, but if you actually think about it, it doesn't. It's not that ridiculous. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Like, I mean, both of them should be. You can legal. have sex for free, but to pay you can't. Right. What other thing is illegal f- to pay, but for free you can't? You know? If both, this is radical. It's kind of the if same both thing. Both were legalized, though. Just think. Yeah. About the regulation, the the lack of of danger that would yeah. that would be happening. Yeah, it is crazy. It's like, I'm not a fan necessarily of prostitution. They're, they're, it, it happened a lot less. Yeah. And in better ways. Yeah, that's uh, why I'm, I'm not like, a fan of prostitution either. But it's, uh, you know, human but it trafficking makes more sense is, for everybody. is, is yeah. things that are tearing apart parts of our country. Yep. That's why, I mean. And dividing people really first and foremost. Yeah, that's that's pretty interesting. I, I, think, um, I think the more open stuff is, like the more... I don't like governmental like paternalism where like the government's telling you what not to do and what to do. It's kind of like, dude, let's be real. Like people are going to have sex. People are going to do prostitution. People are going to use drugs. Like you might as well legalize it, make plans around it. You know, alcohol is legal. It's a dangerous drug. People getting, you know, drunk driving all the time. We've somehow managed for years and years and years. At one point in our history, there was prohibition. And look how that went for us. We're going to look back on the weed prohibition the same exact fucking way. People are going to be like, it was illegal? Weed? It'll be the same for MDMA and mushrooms and a lot of these. Ayahuasca. Mushrooms just got legalized in in Denver, right? Yeah, psilocybin. Psilocybin is coming through. Have you ever done mushrooms? Yeah, um, absolutely. Ayahuasca. What's your experience? Not ayahuasca. Well, ayahuasca is a little more intense. What what was your experience with mushrooms? Um, I th- I think uh, of any drug that you're gonna take, um, first and foremost, marijuana is the best if it, if it should be classified as a drug. And then if you're gonna take um, an upper that's like that, it, it would be mushrooms as it grows out of the ground. And um, I did it in high school. It's literally like the most. And then in college, a decent amount. Um, did I also did like party ecstasy. Kind of thing, I did ec- I did MDMA. Um, we would go to this rave, this party called Fuck Yes, the first Thursday of every month <laughs> at the Drunken Unicorn, which is next to MJQ underneath. Um, <laughs> MJQ is cool. Uh, next to MJQ underneath, what's that? Not, I don't know. Friends on Ponds over there by Chipotle, and across from Motor Kroger, formerly. Mm-hmm. And yeah, man, Dylan Island, this guy DJ Lake Castlevania. Would put I know on that dude? The show, dude, uh, Lake Castlevania. When I um when I was first getting into EDM, I recognized him somewhere and had him sign this hat that I had. 
and uh, he Dylan still is has a dope it signed. motherfucker, bro. Yeah, so he, he and has I still crazy talk. blonde hair. He lives in stuff. LA. We're definitely gonna plug him in. Like he's an amazing. What's up, Blake Castlevania? Human. That's that's I haven't heard. Of, I haven't thought about that name or heard of that name in a long minute. That's that's cool. He made this culture. You know, like we didn't miss this. I didn't miss this party for eighteen months straight. Like. Damn. Yeah. So, anyways, you. So, you, I you're, definitely you're took MDMA during during all that, and I would take the five HTP prior to. So that's if you're gonna do it, here's how to do it: hydrate, eat well, take five HTP. It's like a dollar a pill because it replenishes the serotonin, right? Yeah. So you take it probably three, four, five days before, and you know, just one a day, mm. and start building it up. So once. Not only you're tripping after you have a better experience, it lasts longer, and instead of coming down and having this awful hangover from ecstasy or MDMA, you actually have endorphins chilling in your body for like two ready days. Ready to later. go. Yeah, just ready to go. Like still good. <laughs> I heard a similar experience with somebody with ketamine recently. Like that can do that. And so I think I um psilocybin and mushrooms is a great great way to do that what's your experience with it like did you were you doing it primarily as a party drug or were you ever doing it as like a meditative kind of introspective type of situation or was it always like as a party thing so recently i did it as very very much meditation i feel like you know where i am especially with this look (laughs) (laughs) like spiraling long hair um, when I saw you for the first time, I, I only saw you, I've only seen you from like Instagram, like your Instagram profile picture. I think you still have like short hair. Yeah, it's got to be changed. So then I sure. saw you and I'm like, I'm like, I know that guy's face, but his hair is long. Is that the same like, dude? Like, the same dude? It's definitely the same dude. He's saying, he's saying hi to Chelsea. Okay. Yeah, he's a hippie now. He's yeah. Hippie? Right. And just immediately came in and started talking to you. Yeah. Um, but and, anyways, you, you've done it kind of meditatively. So yeah, I micro dosed, um, Interesting. on a Thursday I took 0.2. And um, just kind of felt it out. And I hadn't done any. So what is that? Like one since tiny before guy? June 5th, 2015, I hadn't done anything. Hmm. And um, <laughs> it was it was, it was was pretty intense, um, but still very, very manageable. Even just the tiny bit? Just the tiny bit. And so then the next day, I took 0.75 and then um, got into a hot tub. And the next day? The next day. You were able to Friday. trip two days in a row? And took <laughs> 0.75 and then a whole G. And then, a whole G. And then while I was kind of peaking, I was in the hot tub on the lacrosse ball that I got from X3 that I've been rolling around on, like stretching my body. I uh, had a couple injuries and was working through that and also just doing this deep kundalini vinyasa breathing and and then I got on the phone with uh my life coach behind Chelsea Zerna her name's Lindsay Hildreth she lives in Texas and um she lives in Atlanta and so I've always kind of been somebody that I talked to for fucking two or three four hours at a time and we talked for two hours while I was tripping and um, <laughs> and just kind of like had a few breakthroughs with different things and we, we, we talked in through like through a lot of like personal things for myself and you know her stuff and um and then I did it again the next day I took um like 1.2 wow so like four days I, I, I did I did 0.7 again and then like 0.5 and um yeah three days in a row dang just kind of felt like it, and then that day I was like by myself on the water like uh, nice it was, it was really really nice that's awesome. So in the past, I would do but it what, a little bit more For people party. that haven't tried it, like, what, what, what is it? Because I think people are, like, scared of stuff like that, where they're like, oh, it's psychedelic. I'm going to be in a world. That, you know, they're thinking it's like DMT, where you're going to be, like, in another world, like, passed out, like, freaking tripping your balls off. It's like, you're still in reality, but you're just, like, blah, right. like, expanded consciousness, right? Like, what, what, how would you describe it for people who haven't done it? Or, Deeply, or, yeah. yeah. Consciousness is expanded. You're thinking and feeling things that you normally wouldn't. Um, Do you feel like a like deep connection with like ancient stuff? Sometimes. A couple of people have said that, and I definitely feel that too. I definitely can relate with that, empathize with that. It's all about what you make of it. Mm. And if you want to go into this trip, think you're going to be tripping and shoot yeah shawty you won't be tripping <laughs> and not it, it, love and embrace that but if you do stay in that moment and recognize and identify 
what those feelings are and run with it, then you can get into these, these parts of your body, these vulnerabilities. That's the whole reason that you do drugs mm. is to get into vulnerabilities that you don't normally have. And um, mm. that's, that's really what I would recommend any, any person is to um, make sure you're in a comfortable environment with people that you trust particularly somebody who's done it before experience with it. Make sure you stagger. You don't take all of it at once. That's stupid. Mm. There's literally nothing smart about that with anything. Why would you not consistently take it two or three times throughout the night broken up over time instead of all at once? And, um, you know, not only have the, the plateau have the patience, experience. Though. They're like, well, it's going to take a while to kick in and, once it kicks in, I don't want it to be like a little bit. I want to do the whole thing all at once. Very true. A lot of people. <laughs> um, <clears throat> good luck to you. <laughs> going to go to the moon. And, and that's cool. You're not going to die from shrooms. Nah. <laughs> but you will you can have a real bad I experience. I think you're going to. Right, yeah, you'll definitely. I've never had a bad experience on it, but I can easily see how you could if you don't allow yourself to kind of fall into it. Mm-hmm. If you're like resisting it hardcore. Even with weed, you can do that. You know, like even if you're feeling that you 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 know you get scared and you're like, I don't like this, I don't like this. Right. Like you got to just kind of let it take its course and like kind of give into it. You and understand and appreciate as you're giving into it that mm. you're not doing anything wrong. That's true. You're doing something right. This a lot is of good. people this, do have this. That. Should be legal. It is legal in a lot of ways and in a lot of places, and it will be legal. So the first time I did it was in Amsterdam where it was legal. So mm-hmm. I didn't feel that like I felt a little bit of that like guilt and shame from my like religious right. roots sort of like of shame. like yeah. Shame. You know what I mean? Like you don't want to be doing <laughs> like drug you know you don't you're not you're not like well I'm doing drugs is bad. I'm doing I'm doing drugs is bad, okay? But um <laughs> <laughs> you just spilled your water. Yes. <laughs> but um <laughs> but uh the, the first time I did it I um was with my friend Tom who'd done it before. And uh, we were in this beautiful park in Amsterdam. Oh, we just had an amazing time, man. Like, it was really, really cool. And, um, yeah, dude, I, I I remember feeling, like, very connected to, like, I remember thinking, how crazy is it that I just ate something that straight up grows out of the ground? This sounds so hippie. Straight up grows out of the ground, and when you take it, you trip balls. And, like, well, I mean, it does like you, yeah, you literally, your mind, it, like, almost, it's, it's what I uh, likened it to one time. I was trying to explain it to my mom. Is like imagine if you lived in a house your whole life and then randomly on like the you know you lived there for like 20 years or whatever and then randomly one day you discovered a whole nother room or a whole nother basement like you didn't even know you had a basement and then you just discovered it or an and it was like finished you know like there, it wasn't just like an unfinished basement it was like what the fuck there's a fridge down here there's like it's like stocked with beer like you know what i mean like you you're like opening another level to your brain that you're like what and like the fact that when you're tripping with someone else you can kind of share in that experience Mm -hmm. too like that's pretty crazy and the fact that like everyone kind of uh you know you see like geometric stuff and stuff like that like you see things that are yeah you see you know trails and ways and it's crazy because i always was thinking about this the whole time i'm like dude no wonder like the native americans like you know would draw stuff like what they drew or you know no wonder that in like most creative stuff. people in history have yeah been ones to do this the reason steve jobs or, or no got wonder, to where he was no, is after he no went wonder like cavemen thought there was a god and stuff you know what i mean because like you just eat this mushroom that's like this magic literally magic mushrooms they call them dude to the untrained person that doesn't know about science th- that shit is magical as fuck you eat them and you do your brain does a thing that it's never done before and it's i mean whether it's r- real or not you know, it's like kind of up for debate because it's like it's all in your mind, but everything's all in your mind, kind of, because you live in your mind, right? Because all Facts. you know, anyway, not to get too freaking whatever. That's the only but, way to get. Yeah, it's exactly. Philosophical, but um, but anyways, I digress. But it, it is um, it it was a it was honestly like a life changing thing for me when I did it for the first time in Amsterdam. I've done it a few times since then, but um, like a, a maybe like three or four times total. But it's. It was, I didn't, I knew it going in, I wanted to take it seriously and, and I didn't take it lightly and I'm glad that I didn't. And I think a lot of people do stuff like that, you know, psychedelic drugs or whatever, they're doing it only to like party, but it's like, that's like 
in my opinion, one of the worst places Absolutely. to do it. Because you're you're you should take that to like expand your mind and try to explore yourself. And when you're in a party environment, that's the last thing you're going to be doing because you're being simulated by all these other people. You can if you've kind of conditioned yourself that's to true. do that. Which actually, that Saturday, I was around a whole bunch of people. Um, mm. And before I went and had that alone time. That and, is true. And then I, ha- it was I have fine. with like, a decent amount of people and, and you can. I just tend to like either really want to talk to people or like really get quiet and like really do my own thing and like go off on my yeah, own. Yeah, you're a quiet person. <laughs> yeah sometimes they can be um but dude this has been an awesome podcast i feel like this is a good place to wrap things up let's talk about your podcast it's coming out soon um w- you know obviously it's going to be launching i don't know if it's probably not going to be out by the time this is out because it's coming out on monday i think so but what can people expect you kind of touched on it a little bit with you know talking about the politics stuff but what can people expect um and all that kind of stuff plug away so atlanta happenings mm. local stuff um the mr atlanta podcast will talk about important atlanta and georgian issues focusing really on on ways that you can get active things to do um nutrition is going to be a big part of it my my story than other people's stories i'm going to try to focus on on them and, and piggyback off of that is it going to be uh, um all is there going to be a guest on every episode or some of them by yourself or what's the yeah i'm thinking of guests every time i've actually recorded a decent amount of of material already that i haven't decided if it's of the brand guidelines i want mm. going forward for this brand mr atlanta podcast Yes. Um, Because I want to kind of stick to that. Uh, There's a YouTuber named Really Graceful that puts out a lot of incredible content, which is the stuff that people aren't talking about. So I'm going to have a lot of, um, you know, leftover news uh, focused on on my podcast. Nice. Un- unspoken news is stuff that needs to be talked about. You touched awareness. on a lot of great stuff on this one, honestly. Stuff that I hadn't heard about or talked or, you know, hadn't been here and talked about. So I, I, I'm going to definitely have to yeah. listen in, bro. Education, criminal justice, mass transit, which is the third part of my platform, connecting MARTA with the boat line and street Hell car yeah. and, and everything together in a regional way. That's awesome, man. So sweet. So I'll be definitely sure when it launches to shout you out and all that good stuff. Absolutely. Um, as of right now, you got a lot of like social media channels. Where can people find you on the gram and all that good stuff? Yeah, so David Orland Brown is my handle username. Your bread and butter across the board. <laughs> um, and you can also go to that dot com or Stay ATL, which is my second my my business, my small business. Edgewood Avenue is my location page, and X Three Sports is. My, I, I wouldn't say, I'd say 11 to 7 are my hours, but it's really as soon as I wake up to when I go to sleep. Yeah. I'm doing the branding for X3 Sports. And, nice. And posting. All the branding, all the social media content, all that good stuff. Yes, sir. Sweet. Awesome You'll have to go there. through and uh, interact and, and uh, caption each plug that yeah. we've done throughout. Exactly. Yeah, that'd exactly. Be good. Awesome, dude. Thanks for having me, man. Well, it's been a blast. Dude, this has been an awesome podcast. Seriously, the, AJ was saying this has been a really good one. I think so, too. It's always one of those uh, good ones when you get into some deep philosophical shit and you get to know someone a little bit better. So, dude, this has been awesome. And uh, we'll see you later, everybody. Thanks for listening. Boom. There you have it. Thanks for listening, folks. If you made it here to the end. Um, that is a really good sign because that means you probably enjoyed this episode. And it also means that I've got a couple of recommendations of similar episodes that I think that you would personally really enjoy if you like this episode. So number one, go check out episode 114 with my friend Matt Thomas. He's actually a mutual friend of me and David, or David and I. I don't know the correct way of saying that, David and I. Um, but he is a philanthropist, he's a fighter, and he's a massive world traveler. He's done a lot of amazing traveling. During that episode, we talked about founding Brawl for a Cause, which is an amateur boxing event where everyday people literally fight for causes that they believe in. We also talked about him being able to rub shoulders with some amazing people, his uh, travels all around the world, 
and we talked about and we talked about growing up in a broken household and how traveling has affected him at a young age. That was a really awesome episode. Go check it out. Also, definitely go check out episode 103 with my friend Chelsea Zerna. Chelsea is actually David's life coach. We talked about her a couple of times during this podcast. And during that episode, we talked about um, her journey from her regular day job to quitting her job to become a digital nomad and all kinds of other amazing, crazy stories, um, facing objections from her family. Um, It was an awesome, awesome episode. Definitely go check that one out, episode 103, and it's called Day Job to Digital Nomad. Thank you guys so much for checking this show out. If you're still listening, I would really appreciate it if you could screenshot this and put it on your Instagram story. Um, That would really help out. Seems to be one of the best ways to promote the podcast. A lot of people um, share recommendations for things on their Instagram story. Um, But if you don't have Instagram, just uh, do plain old word of mouth. You know, people are always asking for podcast recommendations. People are really into podcasts these days. So, um, you know, if people are talking about podcasts, I would really appreciate you mentioning um, my show. But if you want to follow me on social media, you can go to my website, andrewdeitch.com. You can find all the links to my social media accounts there. Um, that's pretty much it. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I will see you guys in the next one. The, his sister was bringing in straight cats who were shitting on the wall. How did they First shit on semester. the wall? Did they just scoot their butts against the wall and shit? You tell me, sir. <laughs> how, how did, did they throw their shit <laughs> 10 feet up? It was this up? place off of Beaver High. There's a lot of straight cats, and she had a big heart, and she just wanted to take these cats in. And I, and I said, it's just not for me.